Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC 244, Jorge Masvidal versus Nate Diaz. And Shaq, it's going down this Saturday in New York, New York at Madison Square Garden. Two of the most exciting welterweights of all time. Two former lightweights fighting for the baddest motherfucker title this Saturday. And I have a feeling that no one's going to be diving on legs in this fight, Shaq. Yeah, you got two very controversial guys. Jorge Masvidal coming off his epic five-second KO, the fastest KO in UFC history. And Diaz, we already know what he brings to the table. He's one of the most intense guys there is. So this is going to be a great fight. Neither guy is going to back down. Both guys have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. You're not going to see too much trash talking here. They know it's the street Jesus versus uh, the hooked on phonics guy. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think this is going to be a great matchup and uh, one of the most intriguing fights, you know, in a while. Yeah, it definitely is, and it's just two fan favorites going to go to town, going to go to war for our entertainment, and I'm really excited, man, because I've been a fan of Nate Diaz his entire career, been a fan of Jorge Masvidal his entire career, and you know, uh, I see a lot of people talking about how this is uh, two journeymen uh, fighting for this title, and I think that's uh, such a slap in the face to two guys that have really paid the way for a lot of up-and-coming fighters, not to mention these guys are being paid in the millions. Uh, when we talk about journeyman fighter, I talk about guys like Derek Krantz, no offense to him, uh, not these two guys who are about to take home nice six- to seven-figure checks, and... Move up uh, towards uh, the top three in the rankings. Well, yeah, you know, the journeyman, I think that came from mostly Kamaru Usman and Kobe Covington, who both only have two losses combined. And Diaz and Masvidal are going to get paid more for uh, their fight. And it's just two different paths. So I feel like that's where the, the journeyman thing came in. And look, those guys have the right to feel the way they do. Like I said, they've only both of them only got one loss. So it's going to be like, uh, yeah, this, this whole journeyman talk, G George has pretty much uh, reinvented himself after that uh, whole two years off and Diaz. Yes, you know, he picked up a nice one against Pettis' his last fight. So, you know, uh, this this journeyman stuff needs to... Uh yeah, it needs to, it needs to stop, man. Uh, these two are walking home with dream paychecks. And uh, I know uh, Kamaru and Colby ain't getting paid as much as Nate and Jorge. And for a reason, we want to see Nate and Jorge fight. Not that I don't want to see Kamaru and Colby. Uh, that's number one versus number two, for sure. But when you talk about Diaz and Masvidal, you talk about guaranteed violence. And the only guys that really go out there and beat them are guys that, quote-unquote, avoid the fight. Well, the good news here is that neither Masvidal nor Diaz is going to avoid the fight. And that should turn out to be a, hopefully a guaranteed 50k bonus if not a fight of the night i also disagree with what you just said there you know when they say avoid the fight it's like <laughs> like i get what you're trying to say but uh that's a, a casual perspective but that's why they're making a separate belt for this because they know that if either two of these guys were to get in there with covington and usman covington and usman are round winners there they like to wrestle a lot more so i get it from that perspective but uh i mean both guys have also been beaten hands fair and square there several times too so i respect both guys but uh you know the bmf title is it a little bit too much you know i guess we need a prop for the main event i i guess these are the two biggest stars currently in the ufc steven we know what steven Steve, for jorge's perspective they both lost to benson henderson uh if benson henderson avoided the fight with versus diaz i mean he calf kicked him he fell down and he I mean, if that's what we to call avoiding a fight, or uh, Masvidal's case, uh, Wonder Boy Thompson, if he avoided the fight, he <laughs> dropped he dropped him. So I mean, you know, I think it's complete horseshit. But fucking, uh. <laughs> that's that's their perspective. According <laughs> yeah. to them, anytime anytime anyone's he actually tried to fight them, from what I remember, he floored him. So <laughs> from what I remember, uh, Benson Molly whopped him. But okay, <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, let's let's get on with these uh, with this fight breakdown. But uh, no one's uh, <laughs> clamoring to see uh, exactly. Benson or <laughs> Wonder Boy. So, you know, it's all about uh, Masvidal and Diaz. And, I mean, it, it's cool to see these guys get their due because I remember, you know, staying up at uh, my girlfriend's apartment watching Masvidal take on Paul Daly at Shark Fights, staying up late on the Internet, finding some shitty stream. And, uh, man, I, that's how long I've been down with Masvidal. And for Diaz, I mean, you know, we talk about uh, the Clay Guida fight back at, well, what was it, UFC 94 when when uh, GSP fought BJ Penn the second time. That was like the first uh, Nate Diaz fight that I saw and then had to go back and watch the entire career. And turned out the guy won the Ultimate Fighter. And you go back and you watch that season, it was a lot of fun. So both these guys are great characters. And now they get to meet in the main event. So I'm very excited about that. So we got to give a, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Flav CBD. Make sure you guys go to flavcbd.com and use the promo code BATTLE 
to save 10% off any purchase because to produce the industry's purest and most potent broad spectrum CBD oil, Flav starts with 100% organic lab tested cannabis that's certified to be of the highest quality grown. Their broad spectrum CBD oils preserve the complete cannabinoid and terpene contents of the raw plant to magnify the therapeutic benefits of the plant's individual components in what's referred to as the entourage effect. So lately, you know, I've been dealing with some injuries from jujitsu. So what I really like is the premium hemp oil CBD salve and this unique proprietary blend is made with premium organic hemp cannabinol and key components combined to nourish and balance the skin, formulated with added antioxidants to maximize anti-inflammatory and healing properties, making it an excellent option for post-workout soreness. Non-staining with a gentle cooling effect, this will quickly become your go-to recovery balm. And I swear by this stuff, uh, when I'm getting my ass kicked, on the reg, which I tend to do in jujitsu, definitely got to use that Flav uh, CBD salve. Definitely gets the job done. So make sure you hit them up at flavecbd.com and use that promo code BATTLE to save 10% off. Well, Shaq, let's break down this whole card start to finish because first up in the featherweight division, we got Julio Arce. He's 16 and 3, and Hakeem Dawadu is 10 and 1. Currently, they got Hakeem Dawadu minus 135. The comeback on Julio Arce is plus 115. Shaq, two very exciting strikers. In the 145 pound division, Hakeem Duwado has been finally coming into his own. I know he had that setback in his debut. I know that a lot of people thought he might have fucked around even in the World Series of Fighting fights, but now you start to see the potential. And with Julio Arce, always been a very solid fighter. Who do you think gets it done? Man, that that guy Hakeem Duwado. I mean, he just has a uh, very mean face. <laughs> I mean, he's always seems angry for some reason, and he's got a tattoo that says "mean" on his chest. So. I guess it's uh, very appropriate that he has that nickname. And Arce, his last fight, I went very big on him against Arosa. You know, Arosa's not UFC level. Kinda, it was actually kind of playing out a lot closer than I thought it was, but Arce eventually did get that knockout. He was coming off the loss to Shaman Marais, which was a very bloody, bloody uh, battle, a fight where Julio got dropped two or three times. Um, but I liked his resilience in that fight. He didn't quit. He was able to get on... Uh, Shaman Marais is back a couple times after that. So this is a very closely matched fight. Hakeem Duwadu opened up north of minus 150. I think he opened like up minus 165. I mean, I definitely don't think uh, an underdog play on Julio Arce is a bad a bad uh, bet by any means. The guy is 16-3, and three, Tiger Shulman, very good striker, a professional kickboxer, if I'm not mistaken. But I think Hakeem Duwadu, man, is, like you said, getting more comfortable in that UFC cage. I think he's got a lot more size than uh, Julio Arce. I think he's got a lot more power than Julio Arce. It's just a matter of Hakeem has a tendency to start a little bit slow, like we saw in his last fight against uh, Asian Poye, that he, uh, you know, Asian Poye, but I'll tell you what, Asian Poye, it's, it's, it's unfortunate the kid got cut because he's got some of the fastest darts in and out that you're going to see. Uh, but, man, I think Hakeem Duwadu is going to maybe start off a little slow in the early portions, but I feel like eventually when they get close to each other, there's going to be a big power difference. And I see Hakeem Duwadu landing the harder shots uh, for a decision win, but if not, I wouldn't be shocked if he knocked him out. Arce's been hurt several times before, and I wouldn't be shocked if it happened here again. Yeah, I mean, you definitely make some good points. Uh, this team, Hakeem Duwadu, definitely seems like he's got a lot of physical advantages. Seems like the more talented fighter, but I've always respected Julio Arce a lot because, like I mentioned uh, in some of my previous breakdowns of him, not only can this kid give it, but he can take it too, for sure. And evidence of that is not only the Shaman Marais fight, where he gets floored 20 seconds in and then ends up taking the guys back that same round, but even the Peter Petty's fight, uh, the way he came back and finished him, I know it's Peter Petty's, but still, he went out there and did his job and got that kid out of there, so I'm very impressed with Julio Arce, and Hakeem Dawadu, finally, like I mentioned, he's finally coming into his own, because in that UFC debut, you know, it, it's one thing to lose to a guy like Danny Henry, but to get starched by that guy right away, that was very alarming, man, and uh, I wasn't sure how he was going to bounce back, but ever since that point, I mean, he's on a three-fight win streak inside the UFC's octagon, granted, the competition has been very subpar, I mean, we're talking Austin Arnett, Kyle Bochniak, and I, I got a lot of respect for my boy, uh, Yoshinori Hori, but you know he's not uh he's not with the company anymore, and even the guy's one loss is to a very subpar fighter in Danny Henry. No offense. So when we talk about Julio Arce, I mean this guy went out there and uh, beat Dan Ige in his UFC debut, who's a who's a serious stud. So you definitely got to give him an edge in terms of competition level, but. In terms of the striking stats, Hakeem Duwadu lands more, he's more accurate, but it's the defense that I got the big issue with because Hakeem is so confident in his offense that uh, 
I mean, the guy is very, very hittable. And this goes back to World Series of Fighting. Even that fight with Steven Seiler where you're supposed to walk through the guy and he's getting tagged with some shots that you're like, man, in the UFC, the right guy is going to floor him. And it wasn't even the right guy that floored him. You're talking about Danny Henry. Danny Henry, guys. So I don't know. Hakeem needs to prove a little bit more to me. So I'm actually going to take Julio Arce for that reason. I feel like he's the more solid fighter, the more proven fighter. And while Hakeem does have some physical advantages and he lands a lot, a very hard hitter, I've been more impressed with Julio Arce up until this point, so I'm going to take him for that reason. But it won't surprise me if this fight goes either way because they're both very talented fighters. Next up in the welterweight division, we got Lyman Good. He's 20-5, and five, and Chance for Encounter is 14-3. and three. Currently, they got Lyman Good minus 125. The comeback on Chance for Encounter is plus 105. Well, Shaq, this fight opened a dead pick at minus 120 apiece. Now it's a pick em with a slight lean on Lyman Good. Similar to Julio Arce, he's also a Tiger Shulman fighter uh, and a former Bellator world champion. Who do you think gets it done here? He was a Bellator Bellator champion back when they only had about prior to Askren, prior to Korshkov, prior to the Got Douglas both guys Lima. he lost to. <laughs> <laughs> prior to the Douglas Lima signings. You know, that's why he was the champion back when they only had like six guys. On him, MTV2 so. and Bjorn was on the show. <laughs> you know, so uh, Lyman Good, I feel like he's got an inflated, uh, kind of inflated resume just because he's a former Bellator champ. But when you really look at his resume, he really hasn't beaten anyone significant. Um, two UFC wins over Alan Craig and Ben Saunders. I mean, if you can't knock Ben Saunders out by now, and hey, Craig did beat Chris Lehman, so and he knocked out Sapo Natal, so <laughs> you know. Uh, but he dropped a seventy. That guy was done. Look, I think Lyman Good isn't as scary as he as he looks, but at the same time, he does have double digit knockouts. He is a Tiger Showman striker. He does know how to slip and rip punches, and that's the weakness in Ren Counter's game is his boxing. Ren Counter, the one thing I'll give Ren Counter is he's got a great chin. We saw his last fight against Nardi have cracked him several times. I mean, shin to chin. I mean, body. I mean, it was getting really ugly. Nardiev is a young kid, though. I feel like Nardiev went into that fight with a bad, not a bad mindset, but just he probably thought he was going to run Ren Counter over right away. And he is a twenty, a 21-year-old, 22-year-old kid will do things like that. I'm not going to just, that was a great win for Ren Counter. I mean, I still think Nardiev is going to, you know, from a year from now, we're going to sit and say, uh, Man, can you believe Nardi have lost to Ren Counter? <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that Ren Counter is going to lose this fight, but if he stands in front of Lyman Good, it's definitely going to favor Lyman Good. But one thing we know about Lyman Good is, historically speaking, if guys get on his legs, make him wrestle like Koroshkov, like Damian Maya, I know those guys are probably got a. What about that kid on tough? Oh, yeah, Ian Stevens, who's actually from Georgia, by the way. You know, he's another college wrestler. And a lot of people don't know is. Ren Counter, uh, word on the street is he had a good wrestling match with Usman back in the day in college, and of course Usman won. Uh, I think Ren Counter said he, he he beat him up pretty good, but you know, hey, he was the get, dude's definitely got some legit wrestling credentials. His first fight in the UFC against Bilal, things definitely didn't go his way, but he bounced back. He moved out to Cali, he quit his job, and uh, it seems like he's improving fight to fight. So you know, I would not be shocked if we see another improved version of Chance Ren Counter. And to be honest, I can go ahead and say I feel like Ren counters are a lot tougher than Lyman. Lyman's one of those uh, pretty muscular guys that, you know, they they look really scary, but, you know, Ren Counters never told uh, his corner men that I don't want to get knocked out. So, you know, that's just facts. Uh, <laughs> I mean, look, I know uh, Eliza Zaleski would knock Ren Counter out pr probably, you know, fairly quickly, but, you know, at least he, he wouldn't be scared to get knocked out is what I'm trying to say. And that, so Lyman Good, what I'm trying to get to is a mental case. It's all, it's mental with that guy. Um, so I feel like Ren Counter is a very live dog, but, you know, I feel like it's a 50-50 fight. I feel like, you know, if Ren Counter can't keep him down and hold him down, that, you know, we might see, you know, his somewhat ugly kind of stand up. So I, I'm not going to sit here and try to say that the where the line is currently is, is wrong. So I feel like, you know, if you believe Ren Counter is going to win, then believe him. I'll, I'll pick Ren Counter for the win. It's not a very confident pick. I, I feel like these guys are. Uh, you know, if it's a striker versus grappler fight, so whoever keeps it in their realm is going to win. But I'll pick Ren Counter. I think he's a little tougher. I think he's going to want it a little bit more. I know Lyman's fighting in his hometown. He got a knockout in his home uh, in Madison Square Garden not too long ago against Ben Saunders. But I, I think Ren Counter, after a win like that over Nardia, where he was significantly counted out, I mean, maybe he runs with it. Yeah, I mean, it's one of these fights where 
I hate describing the striker as grappler, you know, saying that, well, on the feet, Chance is going to get his ass beat, and on the ground, Lyman's not going to get it back up, but historically speaking, that tends to be the case. I mean, on the feet, Chance or Encounter lands less than one strike a minute, and that's uh, that's really damn alarming, but luckily for him, his takedowns are very, very on point. He can mix up his attacks in that, in that area as well, and uh, when he's on top, uh, dudes don't tend to get back up, but at the same time, you know, we're talking about a guy that went to a split decision with Jake Lindsay. So you gotta, you definitely have to proceed with caution. But I've been impressed with the kid because he's been making improvements every single fight. That fight with Bilal Muhammad was one of those situations where Bilal Muhammad was in cruise control the entire time. Chance for encounters, giving it 100% of what he's got. You gotta, you gotta respect the kid for that. He's gonna go out there and fight his heart out no matter what. But since that point, went out there, finished Kyle Stewart in the first round. And that fight with Nardiev goes out there as a massive underdog, weathers the storm. And uh, grinds the kid out. So I got to give him a lot of respect. And with Lyman Good, we've been hearing this kid's name for a long time on the regional scene, the Bellator scene. I remember watching him on MTV2, uh, you know, in that tournament and all this and that. But the issue with Lyman Good is he has trouble getting up off his back. Now, I think he's gotten better about it. That fight with Zaleski, he got taken down easily, but he got back up. He popped right back up. So that's a good sign for him. You know, we don't got to... Give him shit about getting tapped out by Damian Maya in the first round. I think Chance would get tapped out by <laughs> Damian Maya in the first round as well. So it is what it is. But overall, I do think Lyman is improving that part of his game. But I also think that Ren Counter is a specialist in a sense. Uh, you know, if he tries to strike, he's in big trouble for the most part. His chin's amazing, though. You got to give him credit for that. Eventually, I mean, there's only so long you can take flush KO blows to the dome. So Ch Chance better be uh, diving on legs this entire fight. I'm not convinced he wins, but since I think it's a really close 50-50 type fight and he is the underdog, I'll lean his way. But man, uh, it should be action-packed while it lasts for sure. Now next up in the flyweight division, we got Caitlin Chukagan. She's 12-2 and two, and Jennifer Maya is 17-5. and five. Currently, they got Caitlin Chukagan minus 155. The comeback on Jennifer Maya is plus 135. Well, uh, Shaq, I mean, we know the deal with Chukagan. Uh, she's got the judges paid off, uh, especially here in New York, even though last time she fought in New York, she lost to Liz Carmouche. Let's not forget that. But that being said, man, uh, you think she's going to be able to grunt and run, make those tennis sounds, run around the cage, and uh, win the split decision? You know what Chukagan brings? Uh, a decent amount of volume, uh, a lot of sounds, good footwork. And her last fight against JoJo, that was one of her better performances. Jennifer Mayo was very hyped coming into the UFC. Both these girls lost to Liz Carmouche. Those were, I think they were both their first losses in the, in the, in the company. Liz Carmouche overpowered both of them with their wrestling and just took both of them down with ease. And it seems like Jennifer Maya, uh, she's getting more comfortable. She was the uh, underdog to Alexis Davis. I think it was plus 170. She came through there, and then her last fight, uh, she was a pick -em against Roxanne Mataferi, and she got a 30-26. So one could say that Jennifer Maya is getting a lot more comfortable in the UFC. Not a lot of people thought she was going to body uh, Molly Wap uh, Mataferi like that, and she showed that, hey, <laughs> you know, let's I'm going to put a run to this whole Roxanne, uh, Roxanne thing. But Chukagian... Look, from a betting perspective, for me, it's it's got to be dog or pass because, look, we know what type of fight Chukagian most likely fights in. She's lost in Madison Square Garden before. I know she's gotten a lot better, but we know that most likely at the end of this fight, we're not going to know who for sure won. I feel like Maya's got a lot more power. I feel like Maya's got a lot more better cardio than girls like Mara Barella, uh, Joanne Calderwood. She's a former uh, Invicta champion, a lot of experience in five rounders. That's why I think she's got a lot more uh, cardio than those past girls. So I'm going to take Maya. I think it's a 50 50 fight. I'll go with the underdog. I think she's getting a lot more comfortable in there. And I think she gets the upset by landing the harder shots. When you look at her last two fights, she's made girls wobble like Alexis Davis and uh, Roxanne Mataferi. I know those girls aren't necessarily on Chukagan's levels, but I think it's the same thing for Chukagan's opponents as well. So I'll go with Jennifer Maya and a. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a little upset. This is a number one contender match at 125. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have much technical analysis to, to give on this fight. All I'm going to say is that uh, Jennifer Maya definitely hits harder, but Caitlin Chukagan has a way with those judges, so I'm going to say Caitlin Chukagan makes a bunch of sounds and wins a bullshit split decision. Now, next up in the heavyweight division, we got Andre Arlovsky. He's 28 and 18, and Jerzinho Rosenstrike is 8 and 0. Currently, they got Jerzinho Rosenstrike, minus 155. The comeback on Andre Arlovsky is plus 135. Well, Shaq, we were in attendance when Jerzinho went out there and I believe set the record for fastest knockout in heavyweight history. Did he beat Todd Duffy's record against uh, Tim Haig? Uh, no. Oh, so second fastest? Yeah. 
think it was nine seconds, right? Was it was it the second fastest? Duffy's was seven, right? Yeah, is that true? Let's look at this. Look at this. Nine seconds. Ah. Todd Duffy still holds the fastest knockout in heavyweight history. So, Jerzino's got the second fastest. You and I were in attendance. Drops uh, the guy that beat Greg Hardy. Ha, ha, ha. Quick again. Sorry, I couldn't even keep a straight face saying that. But uh, drops this guy with a jab and uh, a couple follow-ups. And he was stiff as a board. The whole place in Greenville was on their feet clapping. You think Jerzino can come out here and uh, star Charlovsky? Man, one advantage that Arlovsky has in a lot of his fights is speed. You know, Arlovsky generally weighs in around, you know, in that 240 range. And it's going to be interesting now because Jarzino actually weighs in that range. You know, he's not fighting a, a Rothwell or even a Augusto Sakai where those guys cut to 265 and they're really slow in comparison to Andre Arlovsky. And he's able to catch them with straight punches here and there. And he makes the fight. A lot of his fights, look, he's still got a losing record, but a lot of his fights lately have been, you would think Andre's getting knocked the fuck out this weekend guaranteed like fucking <laughs> and then it's like Walt 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 please <laughs> Walt please come on 29 28 Arlovsky <laughs> so you know Arlovsky does have that tendency but in this particular matchup man I don't know if he's gonna have the speed because like I said Jarzino weighs in and around that range so I think that Jarzino it actually this might actually be the ch the time where Arlovsky is due for his KO loss I know that Jarzino doesn't uh, have the experience he's only fought Alan Crowder, who's a complete bum, but hey, he treated him accordingly, and uh, Junior Albini treated him according, accordingly as well, so of course, Andre Larsky has a, a shit ton, I mean, a fuck ton more experience than Jarzino, but in this particular matchup, I gotta lean with Jarzino for that speed factor. Arlovsky, his main uh, advantage that he has in most of his fights won't be there, and I think that uh, Jarzino comes out here, stands in front of him, and gets a first-round KO. Look, I got a lot of respect for Andre Arlovsky. He's the OG pit bull, this and that, but I hear this narrative going on that, you know, Arlovsky's on some career resurgence. Oh, really? Tell me how a guy who's 3-9 and nine in his last 12 fights is on a career resurgence. That's the biggest bullshit I've ever heard. So I completely disagree with that narrative going around. I mean, I know he's been fighting close with some guys, but 3-9 and nine in his last 12. So don't even sit here and tell me the guy's on some resurgence. And Jairzinho, we don't really know much about the guy except that the guy hits very hard. He's a fast heavyweight. He bangs. Got a kickboxing background. I like the knockouts I've seen. Listen, I pick against Arlovsky every fight. I'm not going to stop here. I'm going Jerzino, Rosenstrike, first round knockout. Next up in the middleweight division, we got Brad Tavares. He's 17-5, and five, and Edmund Shabazian is 10-0. and 0. Currently, they got Edmund Shabazian minus 155. The comeback on Brad Tavares is plus 135. Well, Shag, let me just tell you this. Edmund Shabazian is a bigger favorite against Brad Tavares than Israel Adesanya was. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Going into that Israel Adesanya fight, I mean, I was... You know, I was saying, guys, look, <laughs> I love Brad, but he's fucked. <laughs> and, uh, that's exactly what ended up happening. So we haven't seen him since. He was going into that fight injured, um, and he got injured in that fight. And, I mean, that, he kind of did himself... Uh, Disservice. Yeah, yeah, a disservice because now, you know, he jeopardized himself a lot just health wise. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, his face looks a little bit different, man. <laughs> um, I don't know if he had a facial surgery or. Hey, you like, mean you noticed the fake teeth too? <laughs> uh, some, uh, something's, uh, something's fake within that jawline or that <laughs> fucking somewhere because they don't. Not saying he's gonna lose. But At least he got a new contract. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, they do. But Brad Tavares, look on paper, like it's kind of similar to uh, Rosenstrike and Arlovski in a sense, where Brad Tavares is beating the likes of Theodoro, Jocko, Talis Latus. You know, these guys, all those guys I said were, you know, in the rankings at one point. And Edmund, he's out here beating guys like Jack Marshman. Charles Bird, two cans right there, and then you got uh, his one win over Darren Stewart in which, hey, for a 21-year-old kid, even though it wasn't the most spectacular performance, you got to think he's he's before going into that fight, I don't think he had ever even been past a minute 30. <laughs> like, from what I remember, he was smoking dudes in less than a minute, so obviously he's going to get a little bit tired, especially executing a game plan that he's never never uh, used before trying to wrestle a guy like Darren Stewart, who has been looking the best he ever has, man. So Edmund Shabazian, I've, I've been told on the kid. I, I told you guys to stop uh, shitting on, you know, his coach. Look, Edmund, uh, Coach Edmund, you know, Look, he had to be a yes man with Ronda Rousey. I mean, what do you you tell Ronda Rousey? No, she's about to fucking flip the fuck out on you. Like, you can't tell a chick, an unstable chick like that. Like, I mean, he had to he had to lie to everyone and say that she had boxing in. <laughs> she's knocking out guys in the gym. <laughs> she's, 
look, once you're caught up, once you're caught up in that shit and y'all are getting the type of money that they're getting, like, bro, of course he's gonna look. So I feel like Edmund should be uh Coach Edmund is actually a very, very good coach, a, a, re- a legit coach. So this whole shitting on him, I think, is uh, kind of nonsense. Uh, but as far as this fight with Brad, you know, I'm very high on Chabazin for his age to be that good. Obviously, the kid's going to keep getting better. And I feel like it is a good time to fight Tavares. I feel like Tavares is once again in another setup fight. His last fight, look, his last fight, I said he shouldn't have fought Adesanya. He was on a three or four fight win streak, I said. Brad, they're setting you up, bro. <laughs> like you should got you got to put your foot down and fucking be like, uh, uh-uh, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't falling in for this. Now he originally was matched up against Ian Heinish, which I thought was a better fight for him, just because. Turns out Ian Heinish is a complete fraud, <laughs> <laughs> as we saw in the Brunson fight. <laughs> but uh, but uh, this kid Edmund, man, look, has he shown necessarily that he can be in there with a guy, a perennial top, you know, ten? I'm sure Brad is. He's been in the top ten for the last couple a couple years. Has he shown that he can do what he's done against a top ten level guy? No, but the fact that the kid's shown so many different facets in his game with the vicious knockout power, and I know Darren Stewart's a, you know, a fringe top, you know, thirty guy, but at 21 years of age to go out here UFC and debut. and you're in your UFC debut and to. A lot of kids, like, you know, we see, like, with Crude and Ola Chechuk and all these guys, man, they would have went out there and pulled a stunt. But he, at least, I mean, he did pull a stunt, but he fucking held on and he fucking, he did his he did his job at the end of the day. So I'm going to actually go with Edmund Shabazi, and I know a lot of people are on Tavares, and I get him, man. He's way more experienced, um, fought way better competition, seen, probably seems a little bit refreshed um, with all this time off. And I would not be shocked if he did it, but I just think there's something to this Edmund guy. I think that uh, Coach Edmund has one on his hands here. And I think they've trained the kid the right way. You don't see this kid out here getting cocky or saying stupid shit like, I'm I'm going to fight Adesanya in a year. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The, the kid's very smart. And uh, and I think he's going to get the job done here by, by a knockout. Look, Brad Tavares is a very, very solid fighter. For the longest time, I've called this guy a Hawaiian Bisbing. You know, he's got that, that volume style and unbelievable takedown defense. I love this kid's balance. I've been a fan of Brad Tavares for a while. But the thing with Brad Tavares is it's been the same thing for the longest time. He's a very meat and potatoes guy. He's not going to really go out there and, you know, do something you've never seen before. And there's nothing wrong with that at all, man. There's nothing wrong with being a solid top 10 fighter. He's going to have his job for a long time. Got all the respect in the world with him, for him. Now, Edmund Shabazian, on the other hand, uh, this kid's interesting. I- I'm very intrigued to see what he actually has and how uh, Shaq was talking about how, you know, these young kids, they fight a guy like Darren Stewart. And nowadays, Darren Stewart's been putting it together. I mean, I know a lot of people went out there betting Deron Wynn. Deron Wynn couldn't get the job done. Edmund Shabazian did in his UFC debut. And uh, I was under the impression that Edmund Shabazian was some boxer because of the gym he comes out of, but he's actually a really a very, very talented grappler. And this guy, when he gets you in that body lock up against the fence, uh, it's hard to turn out. It's hard to separate. And then he gets you on your back. It's hard to get back up. You definitely have to respect this kid's grappling a lot. And I mentioned on Twitter I was going to talk about some hot take I have on Coach Edmund. And Shaq kind of took the words out of my mouth. Uh, it turns out Coach Edmund is actually not that bad of a coach. It's just that... You know, when you're on Ronda's payroll and you're making the most money you've ever made with that specific fighter, you got to cater to her bullshit. You got to say that, oh, she can box Floyd Mayweather. You got to say that. I'm a yes man. I mean, do you want that million or not? You know what I mean? Do you want your percentage or not? (laughs) (laughs) You know, say all that bullshit. Say that, uh, you know, she, he was saying some stuff like, you know, she's firing with her right now. She's firing with her left. Uh, You know, she's putting down. knocking out world champion boxers. (laughs) She's putting down guys in the gym with body shots. <laughs> so, like, it all makes sense. Yeah, why. I'm sure she is putting down fucking Jake Ellenberg. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense why he was saying all that. Uh, listen, money talks at the end of the day, but then we've seen what he's done with other fighters. And I know some people are going to be like, what did he do with Travis Brown and Jake Ellenberg? Guys, guys those guys were lost causes before they even went there. So, I mean, 
Jake Ellenberger was with Master Hoffa. Master Hoffa couldn't get him right, so it doesn't matter where they go. Just like I was talking about how John Jones can train at any gym he wants, even his own garage, and still be the world champion. Well, these guys that are completely shot, like Travis Brown and Jake Ellenberger, they can also train anywhere they want, but it'll be an opposite effect. It won't matter, because when you're done, you're done. So don't don't use those examples on me. Let's talk about this kid, Edmund Shabazian, who's actually Coach Edmund's protege, his star pupil. I like what this kid brings to the table. You know, there's nothing delusional about him. Uh, there's no, you know, delusions of grandeur and this and that. He's just a very solid guy who's got a very distinct game plan, and he goes out there and he executes it. And I like the fact that, in that Darren Stewart fight, he was able to, I mean, I think he attempted, what, 21 takedown attempts or something among those lines. I think that, uh, I like the fact that he can be relentless with it the entire time. And when he started to gas out, first of all, with some of these guys, if you stuff their initial takedown in the first round, they're, they're ready to go home. With Edmund Shabazian, he didn't reach that fatigue spot until late in the third, and he still survived when it happened. Then I saw one thing I was very impressed with by Edmund Shabazian is that not only is he a strong wrestler, but the guy's got some jujitsu too. When he was on his back uh, and Darren Stewart was trying to pound him out, all of a sudden Edmund Shabazian's rolling for knee bars. He's recomposing his guard. He's getting back up to his feet. He's reversing the position. So this kid is a very, very solid grappler. You cannot underestimate that. I know that it's not the most fan-friendly style to go out there and hug someone up against the cage, but you have to respect it because... It's a legitimate way of winning fights. Uh, you know, people give fighters a lot of shit for going to decision, even though Edmund finishes most of his fights in the first round. But people give fighters a lot of shit for winning decisions. Guys, you know winning a decision is a perfectly fine method of winning, right? How many fucking decisions has Brad Tavares won? <laughs> He's Hawaiian Bisbing. But, uh, yeah, so one thing I want to say, though, because the fight that kind of influenced my pick here was the Elias Theodoro fight because that's the last guy to not just take down Brad Tavares but to take him down three times and I know Brad Tavares had some very impressive uh takedown defense in that fight I know he hit that switch I know he made Elias go face first into the mat at one point you got to respect that and I know he's going to be trying to do similar moves here but in that second round I kind of saw what we're going to see this weekend, which is Edmund Shabazian getting him up against the fence. And when he does, I don't think that Brad Tavares is going to be able to separate forever. I think maybe on the first one he can disengage, maybe on the second. But eventually, he's going to get tied up. He's going to get dragged to the mat. And whether he gets pounded out, whether he survives the decision, look, this is a very tough guy we're talking about. This is a guy that went the distance with Yoel Romero and Israel Adesanya. He's also been knocked out by Robert Whitaker and Tim Bosch. So it could be a knockout. It could be a decision. But the bottom line is I'm going... <laughs> you know, Seth Bozinski's soccer kicked him in uh, on tough. Look, like I said, it could be a knockout, it could be a decision, but the bottom line is I'm going Edmund Shabazian to get this win. Now, next up in the featherweight division, we got Shane Burgos. He's 12-1, and and Makwan, Mr. Finland, Amir Khani is 15-3. and Currently, they got Shane Burgos minus 245. The comeback on Makwan Amir Khani is plus 205. Shaka, obviously... We're, we're, we've been impressed with both guys, but for different reasons. Shane Burgos has all the talent in the world. He's got all the athleticism, and he's got the skill too, but the guy loves to fuck around. So with Shane, it's always been like, Shane, stop playing, man. You can take care of these guys right away. I mean, you remember that Charles Rosa fight should have been stopped in the first round and uh, kind of lets Rosa back into the into that fight, might have arguably lost the second, takes him to the third to put him away. And with Makwan Amir Khan, and, and before I get to Makwan, what about that Kurt Hollibo fight? Gets dropped by Kurt Hollibo? Like, Shane, stop fucking around. Stop fighting with your hands down. And with Makwan Amir Khan, I've been very, very impressed with this guy as well because he's one of these relentless grapplers. He can get takedowns from anywhere. Very, very physical. And he's not just out here, you know, fighting a bunch of scrubs either. You saw him go to split decision with a guy like Arnold Allen, who we hold in very, very high regard. So this is going to be an interesting fight, man, because... While I do think that Shane Burgos is the more talented fighter, he's the better athlete, and he's got the higher ceiling, can we get Shane Burgos to stop playing around for once? And Because eventually it's going to bite him in the ass. I know it bit him in the ass when, when he fought Cater, but honestly, he could have fought Cater with his hands up. He would have still gotten knocked out. But here against Makwan Amir Khan, he might think, oh, Jason Knight dropped this guy. I can totally fight with my hands down. And even after he got knocked out by Cater, he goes out there against Kurt Hollibow, still fights with his hands down, gets dropped. The next fight against Cub Swanson, you're thinking, dude, you got a shot fighter coming off a couple broken jaws, coming off all these losses. Go ahead and then floor him in the first round. Against top five guys. And that's just facts. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one judge had it 30-27 Swanson. So I'm just saying uh, Shane Burgos, he's got all the talent, but he has to be serious in there. And with Makwan Amir Khani, 
If you're not serious with a guy like that, he's going to get on top of you. You're not going to be able to get back up. You're going to start signaling to the ref. He's just holding me, ref. And, you know, if Shane starts doing shit like that, he's going to lose this fight. Now, I do agree with Shane being the favorite here just because I think he's the more talented guy with the higher ceiling. But this is a dogger pass situation if I've ever seen one. And uh, at plus 205, I do think you got some value on Makwan. He's just got to go out there and execute the game plan. I don't know if he does because Shane's very talented. Shane's got good takedown defense, decent get-ups. So we'll have to see. You think Shane's going to fuck around again uh, in this fight, Shaq? I'm leaning Shane, but I, I don't know, man. It's a dogger pass fight for me. I'm picking Shane, but at the betting window, I would be taking Makwan or not betting it at all. Well, yeah, I mean, it's pretty evident who the better striker is. Shane Burgos, I mean, he's fought. He's been in there with the likes of a Calvin Katar before. And uh, Makwan... You know, in his one of his last three fights, we're talking the Arnold Allen fight, in which the reason why he lost that fight is because he got touched too many times with uh, Arnold Almighty's straight left hand. And after that fight, I word on the street is the kid uh, started amateur boxing. He took six amateur boxing fights, went four and two. And you know, four and two might not be the best, but hey, look, amateur boxing is a completely different sport. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I like what I'm seeing. I love. Lo I'm a big fan of Makwan, Mr. Finland Americani. I mean, I love his intensity. I love, uh, you know this whole vibe and not to mention uh, another thing that can't be played don't be shocked if maquan comes uh to msg with, with some of the finest steroids uh <laughs> on the eastern on the uh on the european coast because look i've heard I've, i heard there's a little rumor going around spread by arjan bueller that maquan actually got banned from uh vada in wrestling because uh you know he's uh they were, they were banging him over yeah. and uh but I'll tell you what, I saw Maquan Maquan earlier uh, a couple of days ago, and he, he's looking good, man. He's <laughs> and uh, now he's mixing this amateur boxing. But yeah, I mean, you pretty much hit it. I mean, look, Burgos is the better striker, and if he keep can keep it on the feet, and it does appear that he might be simply too big. This guy might be one of the top you know five biggest featherweights on the roster he might be too big for uh Maquan to just you know shoot a, a standard double single leg and get a takedown Maquan's gonna have to hurt him with a punch first for for this to for this to work out in my opinion and it can happen because like you said Kurt Holabaugh dropped him with a punch and Kurt Holabaugh is a complete you know can I know Holabaugh's got a lot more knockouts but I feel like Maquan I mean he probably isn't quite there yet when we're talking about Burgos Burgos is clearly a better athlete, but like you said, the kid has a bad habit of dropping his hands after he throws. And he that's just the style he likes to implement, man. He likes to do slip and rips. He likes to use head movement. He, that's just what he's going to do. So we know he's going to do it here. He cuts a lot of weight. Don't be shocked if Maquan comes out here and sparks him and then gets a hold of that neck. <laughs> and Shane's like, what? I wasn't up. But, uh... uh it's a, like, yeah, I agree. Dog or pass. I feel like uh, it's probably... Closer to where the line opened at, uh, it's, I think it opened like minus 185, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I feel like it's more around there, but I'm very high on Maquan. I think that even if he loses this fight, he can go back to the to the Euro cards and put in work. But uh, obviously, Chris Fishy, Fishy Lad ain't, Fishy Lad's a complete fraud and a cokehead um, <laughs> <laughs> who's got a fake ass 18 and 3 record. So, although I want to give Mach, I want to pick Maquan here, I got to take Burgos. I think he's just currently a little bit more ahead than Maquan, but if he decides, and you guys got to pay attention to the stare down coming Friday. I know they shook hands today, but Maquan likes to play a lot of games. Maquan likes to get inside a lot of guys' heads. Now, Shane pretty much came out and let him know that there probably won't be any of that. Look, Shane, he's, I'll pick Shane, but Maquan, like, like you said, Maquan are pass. Now, next up in the light heavyweight division, we got Corey Overtime Anderson. He's 12-4, and four, and Johnny Walker is 17 and 3. Currently they got Johnny Walker minus 150. The comeback on Corey Anderson is plus 130. Well, Shaq, I've been seeing every single person on Twitter taking Corey Anderson this week, and I've been seeing them uh say things as far as that not only is Corey Anderson gonna win this fight, but he's gonna go out there and finish Johnny Walker. Uh are you aware that Corey Anderson couldn't finish Pat Cummings or John Vellante, Shaq? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is going to be a great fight. Look, this is actually, I don't want to say the people's main event, but like I think that, uh, I guess we could say the the people's co-main event, obviously, the main event. But this is the this is the next biggest fight on the card, in my opinion, just because Johnny Walker, we know that Dana White's in love with him. We know that the brass are 
definitely pushing the issue to try to get him in there with the up there with the Reyes's and the John Joneses up in that title picture. And he needs a word on the street, as I heard Hunter Campbell emailed uh, contracts with Johnny Walker's name on it to Corey about 50 times, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he just got repetitive nose. And look, I, I I see where Corey's coming from. Yeah. For whatever reason, Glover Teixeira had a number three next to his name, and for whatever reason, Alir Latifi had a number four or a five next to his name. I don't. I, Someone explain <laughs> that to me. But look, you guys got to understand. A year ago, the two hundred five division was in complete shambles, and I don't want to take credit from John Jones, but I, I feel like he's almost kind of in a DJ sense, where like uh, his division a year for the for the majority of his career has kind of been like. This guy's not going to actually win. If you get what I'm trying to say, like how DJs, a lot of his fights were like, you know. Let's, just get, this <laughs> Let's get this over with, bro. <laughs> um, fucking, uh, so I feel like the 205 division up until recently, now with the addition of guys like Reyes, like Johnny Walker, like Alexander Ratchik, like Ryan Spann, like all these big guys where they actually look like giants, man. It's like, holy shit, this guy's huge. This guy's 6'5". Um, that the division is slowly changing. Now, Corey Anderson, look. Uh, he got knocked out against Jimmy Manoa, and he got knocked out against OSP, o OSP, and I feel like, look, I think he's a great fighter, well-rounded, as well-rounded as it gets. He can box, he can wrestle, he's got good cardio, beast in 25-8, overtime, the whole thing. But, uh, <laughs> very hard worker, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Corey Anderson. Um, but I feel like this is just one of those cases where, if you would have heard what the kid was saying a couple months ago about Johnny Walker about how it's this and that and basically as the great Israel Adesanya saying uh, as the great Israel Adesanya says or as Kamaru Usman and Tyron Woodley says he's not keeping that same energy bro and and uh look I think that Johnny Walker is just a freak athlete look and I think that when a, when a, he's one of those guys like I kind of compare him to like when uh, Paulo Costa was fighting Yoel Romero, Yoel Romero, you know, I, I bet on Paulo Costa because when I, when I was watching that guy, I was like, bro, you ever seen a fucking physical tank like this ever in the middleweight division in the last fucking 10 years that's out here that since looks like this since since yoel that looks like this and that's fucking marching guys down i mean what he did to uriah hall i was like oh my goodness like this guy's definitely fighting for a title like yoel romero or not i don't give a fuck he's definitely fighting for a title and i feel like johnny walker is up there with a like a reyes apollo Costa. he's a different type of athlete now i know he's got three previous losses prior to four he's been knocked the fuck out he's been submitted but the guy man over the last couple of years has just uh seems like he's just elevated his game and now all he showed he showed glimpses of it all in the past back on the local scene but it seems like now that he's got that push behind him now that let's just be honest here the ufc is grooming him for this that uh he believes in it and when you've seen a guy at 6'5 jumping up and with a fucking vert like that, like, you've seen guys jumping up that high, and it's not even like Serkinov shot in for a takedown. Serkinov was just on the outside, and he still got flying knee. Like, it wasn't like Serkinov was shooting a double or anything. Like, the dude's timing is impeccable. His athleticism is impeccable. And I got a lot of respect for Corey Anderson, but to sit here and act that his chin is quote-unquote patched up or he's he solved his chin problems. <laughs> What? <laughs> but a fucking look, he fought Patrick Cummings, who is a fucking complete can. I know he beat Blakovich, but a fucking Patrick Cummings is completely done. He beat Blakovich like five years ago. Uh and then he beat Glover to share. Okay, he beat Glover to share. Great win. I got I love fucking I'm a big fan of Glover to share, but Glover to share is pushing forty years old and Glover to share is slow and a stiff, like uh, I love Glover, but it's <laughs> it's just the facts. Like Glover to share also doesn't like fighting black wrestlers. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone knows that in the hood. <laughs> and then his last fight against Alir Latifi, who is a 5'8", inflated light heavyweight that's been KO'd fucking how many times? I mean, it's not even like Corey went out there and like fully dominated him. Alir Latifi actually was touching Corey in that first round, but Alir Latifi gasses out a lot, man. Alir, Alir Latifi's a couple fights away from retirement, so I feel like people are are kind of thinking of Corey Anderson a little bit too highly here. I think he's a good fighter, but I don't think that he's ever going to get a title shot. And I could be wrong. He's got the chance to come out here and prove me wrong because the winner of this fight, actually, I don't know if the winner of this is going to get a title shot with 
with uh, with Reyes in the picture. But uh, I think that Johnny Walker is going to get another quick KO. I think that his timing, especially, and I feel like Corey's chin ain't really been tested like that in the in his last three fights and I think it's gonna get tested here and I feel like those chin issues are gonna, you know, be brought back to light here. I think that and then you know people are saying that if this fight goes in the second round that it's automatically a uh, Corey's fight and I'm not convinced he can hold him down. I mean he, I mean he really doesn't hold guys down, man. He likes to just mat return and, and and get back up and if he can gas Johnny Walker out like that, but I think that when Johnny Walker has his moments out in space, I think he will make Corey Anderson pay. And I also think that Corey's kind of backpedaling a little bit. I, but I've been paying attention very closely to what he's how he's been acting the last couple uh months because I, I've been knowing for months that they've been trying to make this Johnny Walker fight. I mean, they've been offering this fight to him maybe even as uh, as long as four or five months ago. I think that Johnny Walker comes out here, gets another quick KO, keeps everyone captivated, and, and inserts his name into the title picture. Like I said, I got a lot of respect for Corey, but I think those chin issues are going to get back, back to light against an elite athlete, a guy with a serious vertical, serious timing, and, and uh, Johnny Walker will be in that title picture come Sunday morning. Yeah, when you talk about this new era of light heavyweights, you're dealing with guys that are six foot five or over with eighty inch reaches or more. And in Johnny Walker's last fight, he was announced at six foot six. I personally think he's six foot seven. Dude's got the eighty two inch reach. And not only that, the guy can fucking fight, freak athlete serious knockout power and this whole thing about well all Corey's got to do is get past the first round oh really what happened when uh Volante got past the first OSP when the <laughs> what happened when when OSP and Volante knocked this guy the fuck out in the third round so Corey can be knocked out in the first he can be knocked out in the third it really doesn't matter and uh with Johnny Walker you know there's this quote going around he's talking about how he wants to go three rounds and it's cute I mean if you hear Johnny Walker if you know about his sense of humor you know he's a hilarious guy you know he trips over the stairs I mean if you watch his contender series fight he trips over laura sanko i mean the guy is really really funny out there you see his celebration dances but one thing i want to say about this whole johnny walker saying he wants to go to decision he said the exact same shit before the misha sarkuna fight he said this fight i want to go three rounds and then he knocks the guy out in 30 seconds so you know, I, I like uh, hearing this kid Johnny Walker talk. I like the way he fucks around with people. He gets in people's heads because, you know, people have this impression that he's not really taking it serious or that he's some kind of joker. And not only that, for some reason, people have something against flashy fighters. I don't get what it is. Like, people are disrespecting Johnny Walker to a point, acting like he's just some flash in the pan. Oh, he can get a couple fluky finishing moves. First of all, what's fluky about a technique that you practice over and over, day in, day out? I mean... Tell me what other guys are landing flying knees like that. That's not something that you just close your eyes, you know, make a wish and uh, land on someone. That's shit that you practice day in, day out. Also, he did this camp in Russia. And in the past, you know, the, the question is what happens if he gets taken down? I saw him go up there against a Polish wrestler, get taken out in the first round, comes back out there the second round, knocks him out with a big knee. So I know this kid can overcome adversity. I know he had some embarrassing losses back in the day, but what's he done since that point? He put together a serious win streak, got his confidence back, and has just been elevating his skill set every single time. And with Corey Anderson, I respect him as well because he's overcome some bad losses himself. But man, the thing with Corey Anderson, acting like his chin has been you know, fixed because he beat Pat Cummins and Alir Latifi? Like, give me a fucking break here. If he eats a clean uh, Johnny Walker flying knee and survives them, then maybe you guys are right that uh, his chin's been fixed, but it ain't been fixed. The guy's got amazing cardio, so therefore he's got great recoverability. But in this fight, the blow is going to be so devastating that he's not going to recover. So I'm going Johnny Walker via first-round knockout. Now, next up in the lightweight division, we got Kevin the Motown Phenom Lee. He's 17-5. and five. And Gregor the Gift Gillespie is 13 and 0. Currently, they got Gregor Gillespie minus 160. The comeback on Kevin Lee is plus 140. Well, Shaq, this is a massive step up in competition for Gregor Gillespie. He's never fought anyone like Kevin Lee throughout his entire career. But that being said, we've been very vocal about uh, Kevin Lee's mental state. How do you think he does here, dropping back to 155 pounds? Yeah, Gregor Gillespie, um, I probably am not as high as I was on him a month ago, you know, when I really sat down to watch the tape. I mean, when you really think about it, guys, he really hasn't fought anybody, and I and I mean that full, wholeheartedly. I mean, I, I got a lot of respect for Yancey Medeiros and Vince Pacella. You know, I, I'm a fan of both those guys, but Vince is pushing 40, and Yancey... Yeah, no disrespect. No disrespect, but... You know, we'll smoke, smoke we with the yeah, I'll smoke. I'll, I'll fire Yancey up, bro. <laughs> but fucking, yeah, you know, enough said. But uh, 
Kevin Lee, you know, definitely another one of those cases where one of the underdog, uh, kind of like Tavares, like Arlowski, where, you know, one of the guys has fought clearly <laughs> the better competition. One's been in there with fucking Kiesa, Ferguson, Trinaldo, Mustafaya, fucking <laughs> uh, Dos Anjos, uh, Ali Kinta, I mean, fucking <laughs> um, Jake Matthews, yeah, I said him, uh, Leo Santos, fucking, <laughs> I mean... I mean, Kevin's seen a whole different level of the sport, and Gregor's been in a lot of a lot of easy fights. I'm talking Jordan Rinaldi, not in the UFC. Uh, Andrew Holbrook, not in the UFC. Uh, Jason Gonzalez, complete can. Uh, Vince Pachel, pushing 40, tough guy, but you know he's a, a journeyman, and Nancy Medeiros is as well. So this is the this is a definitely Gregor's biggest fight on paper and skill wise, man. Because when you're thinking about it, Kevin Lee would go out there and smash all those guys too, no matter if he's washed up or not. Kevin Lee, I'm 100 percent sure he would smash Ronaldo, Pachel, uh, Yancey, and all those guys, man. I think Gregor Gillespie's stand up is still in its developing stages. I actually feel like for the, for this uh, particular fight, Kevin's actually gonna have a stand up advantage you know and that, you can't really say that much in kevin's fights because he's fighting the the list of names that i just said so um the, the the big thing with kevin here is the mental state and when i say the mental state is there is a chance that uh there is a chance that the damage has already been done because when you really think about kevin's career he skipped a lot of steps at the time of him getting that title fight imagine imagine fighting michael chiesa and i, I got a lot of respect for chiesa but Imagine fighting Michael Chiesa, then fighting for a UFC title against Tony Ferguson. There's a couple steps. He should have had a couple, a couple more main events in between there. You know, against a top seven or eight guy first. Chiesa at the time was like you know 11, 12. Chiesa's a nice guy, but he ain't. He was never top ten at 155. He lost to Showtime Pettis. Um, so I feel like Kevin Lee skipped a lot of steps. And when you skip big steps like that, and then you go in there, you, you almost kill yourself making way. You got the staff, you know, you fight Ferguson. And he did good the first round, but it was all a part of, I don't want to say it was all a part of T. Ferg's uh, plan, but T. Ferg fucked his ass up and, and, he, and he broke him hard. And then you go into that fight, you beat Edson Barboza. <laughs> he smashed Edson Barboza. Um, and then the ally Kinta fight, he got Molly whopped in. And then it's like, okay, let's take a step back. But when you got a big ego, like a guy like Kevin Lee, and he's also had a lot of personal issues that I won't get into outside the but cage. Paycheck too. You yeah, can only fight exactly. Time. Exactly. When, but at the same time, it's like from a, from a fighter standpoint, you got, like I said, with Weidman a couple of weeks ago, you got to know where you're at. Like I said, with Vic a couple of weeks ago, uh, you got to know where you're at and you got to be honest with yourself. I know they're throwing money at you to be the co -main event the main event but it's like bro you are on a path that like <laughs> it's not gonna end up well because you're so young kevin's still only 27 but when we really think about it in fight years man he's probably already pushing 40 in fight years <laughs> i mean when you take that damage from dos Anjos. now dos Anjos and all these guys so i feel like kevin lee there is a very good chance that uh the damage has been done but i will say i do think he's a better overall fighter than gregor gillespie i don't want to say gregor is one-dimensional but he's been able to just when you really watch the fights uh the fights that he's somewhat been in trouble in are the jason gonzalez fight and the uh glyco franza fight both those guys were able to get a decent enough time out in space with him and they were both able to wobble him man so there is a chance that uh kevin like I said, he's got the stand-up advantage in this fight. The issue with Kevin is if this fight becomes a dog fight and this becomes a... And, he, and, and Kevin still up to now is struggling with his composure because... But I will say I feel like one of those reasons is we know that Kevin Lee is very chinny. But you got to understand, he's very chinny when he's fighting Tony Ferguson, Rafael Dos Anjos, Ally Akinta, guys with real power in their hands. And I'm not saying Gregor Gillespie doesn't but Gregor really doesn't set up his punches well he doesn't move his head so I think from a betting perspective it's dog or press I would not play the money on Gregor I will say it's a good time to fight Kevin because it just seems like Kevin just I don't want to say that he just doesn't get it but he just doesn't get it and it's sad to see because the kid could have been at one point a couple of years ago when around the time he was fighting Ferguson they gave him that shot because they felt like man this guy's gonna be a, a potential star for us 25 to life hashtag this and that but <laughs> 
But uh, he skipped too many steps, and there is a, a very good chance that the damage has been done, kind of with examples like Vic and Luke Rockhold, Wyman. And it's sad because he's only 27 years old, man. Gregor Gillespie, I'll tell you what, he's going to run into trouble eventually. I feel like if it's, it's going to be one of those fights where if you play Kevin Lee, you're going to end up saying, ah, I faded him one fight too soon. But uh, I'll pick Gregor. It's not a confident pick because, I, like I said, I actually do think Kevin's the better overall MMA fighter. But uh, I feel like Gregor's a little tougher, a little mentally tougher, um, better cardio. But got to understand, kind of like what I was saying with Damian Maya last week uh, that ended up winning, I, that did be, uh, ended up beating Ben Askren, was that I don't think that Kevin Lee's chin is necessarily going to be as big in trouble as it is in, uh, in his other fights. Because in his other fights, he comes out, he pushes his strong pace, he's bullying these guys, but then he gets clipped on the chin and then it's like he wobbles and then shoot a bad shot. I don't think Gregor, when you're fighting Dos Anos, I know Dos Anos is an old man, but when you're fighting Dos Anos and he's throwing flying jump knees and straight and and Ali Kenta, who's got you know real legit boxing, and and uh, Tony Ferguson, who's throwing elbows and and dynamic uh, you know attacks. And but so there is a chance that Gregor is not even on that level just quite yet. But uh, I'll, I'll lean Gregor. I agree with the uh, the opening line though. The opening line was a slight lean on Gregor Gillespie. So I feel like I feel like he'll win. But it's I feel like Gregor. I don't want to say he's a fraud or overrated, but. I see Gregor Gillespie running into trouble when he fights that top ten. When he gets up there with the, with the hookers and the in the car, man. If he fought Carlos Diego Ferreira, like like those type of fights, I feel like that's when he's going to start running into trouble. Yeah, very very good points, man. Uh, look, when the fight was announced, I was like, oh, Gregor's going to kill him, all this and that. But then you sit down and actually watch their fights, and Shaq's got some very good points. Gregor's been fighting some very very soft competition for someone that's in the top fifteen. He's, he's never beat a top 15 guy <laughs> ever so uh and i'm not discrediting him at all like he's definitely got top 15 him. he's yeah. got top 15 talent he's got top 15 potential but to actually have him in there right now when you understand you've already listed all the guys he's beat so this is his chance to prove that he really is a top 15 guy facing a kevin lee that's lost three of his last four and with Kevin Lee, the thing i'm questioning most is not his skill set it's his confidence it's all about the mental in this fight because if this fight is very close and it comes down to a dogfight, it comes down to who wants to push more, who wants to grind, who wants to be more confident to take that risk and go out there and win that third round if it's 1-1, I am leaning Gregor because confidence is a huge thing in this sport, man. But when it comes to the actual pure skill set, Gregor's got the edge on, on the wrestling for sure. But, I mean, there's jujitsu, there's striking, there's all these other things where I do think Kevin Lee is more seasoned and just experience-wise inside the octagon, for sure. So this is a dogger pass situation, but I got to revert back to the confidence factor. That's really huge for me here, and that's the reason I'm going to take Gregor in this fight. I do think that's going to be a lot closer than people think. I don't think that Gregor is just going to go over there, go out there and run him over. You know, I bet on Gregor when he fought Andrew Holbrook because I knew he was going to go out there and run him over. I'm not convinced he goes out there and runs over Kevin Lee, but I still slightly lean him to win just because he's at a better place mentally in his career right now. So I think he rises to the occasion and gets a close decision win over a very tough Kevin Lee. Now next up in the heavyweight division, we got the return of Derek the Black Beast Lewis. He's 21-7, and seven, and Blagoy Ivanov is 18-2. and two. Currently, they got Blagoy Ivanov, minus 120. The comeback on Derek Lewis is plus 100. Well, uh, Shaq, Derek Lewis... Would appear to be in very good shape for this fight. Looks the slimmest I've ever seen coming off a couple surgeries. You think at this point uh, the damage has been done or you think we might be seeing uh, Black Beast 2.0? This is actually one of the more intriguing fights just because, you know, I like Bogoy, Baga, as I like to call him. Uh, that's his nickname. But uh, Bogoy can box, man, that's for sure. His one twos are very clean. Um, he's from Bulgaria. The guy's a legit gangster. He's been stabbed before. I mean, the guy doesn't talk. Like, he, he, he gives off that persona. Like, he trains at AKA. So there's definitely a chance Bogoy comes out here and outclasses him. But from what I've been hearing that about Black Beast is that for the last couple of years that the guy's been half-ass training and what i've been saying what i mean by half-ass training is his knee's been so fucked up that he can only really train for like an hour a day 
um, no, this is like no treadmill work, no, like barely any type of like, cause his knee has been so fucked up and, and it, and it would show, it would suggest that all his, uh, near stunts that he would pull and then he would come back and get these fluke KOs. So it's kind of, one thing I've always worried about Black Beast is though, how much can you rely on that style for, for a longevity and expect, expect it to work out. So I am having a small, but I've heard that this is the first fight where the guys actually been training like a real fighter i heard this is the first fight where i mean it looks he looks great this is the best he's ever looked I, uh, so i would not be shocked uh if the same thing happened here man but Goy, you gotta black beast has definitely fought the tougher competition i know black boy has been in there with jds and man black boy is very talented i can there's really not much bad i can say besides maybe low volume about black boy because he just likes to rely on he's a quality over quantity still striker. more volume than black exactly beast. exactly so it's like and i've been worrying that black beast i feel like it's a 50 50 fight man um so the dog is black beast so i, I guess i'll pick him but I got I think Lagoy is really good, very underrated. Kinda put an end to the Tui Vasa hype train his last fight. Very good boxing. Beat Fedor and uh Sambo. I mean, but Goy, and he, that demeanor he has, man, is just kind of, it's kind of scary. So I wouldn't fade that guy personally, especially at a, at a line like Pleasant 100. If it was a little more wider, I would say. And, and Blagoy actually opened up minus uh, 195. So the bookies think he is a clear cut step ahead of Black Beast. And that's probably going to be the case there. It's just Black Beast has that MSG car. He fought an MSG and lost before, but it just seems like it might be a Black Beast flu KO type of weekend, man. We haven't seen one. But uh, I'm saying Blagoy dominates him for uh, 10, 13 minutes and then gets full KO. <laughs> it's like, what? Wait. <laughs> yeah, look, that's, def that's definitely a big possibility. And a lot of people remember that I actually picked him to get dominated by Volkov and knock him out in the third round. That's exactly what happened. And he's got a knack for doing that, man. And not only that, we act like he's some comeback knockout artist, which he is, but the guy's got a serious resume too. I mean, not only did he beat Volkov, but the guy also has a win over in Ganu, which is serious. And I know that fight was one of the most quote unquote boring fights in UFC history. They both respected each other's power, but uh, he still went out there against Francis and Ganu for 15 straight minutes. And, uh, and uh, he didn't hit the deck once. So, Francis beat himself. My boy Shaq is saying Francis beat himself. <laughs> and that might be true, but uh, they still locked the cage behind Francis and Gano and Derek Lewis, and Derek got his arm raised. So you got to give him a lot of credit for that. Derek in that fight. But the thing with this fight is that how many times can you get that comeback KO? And now coming off the surgeries, I know he's looking in great shape, but I, I just think that at some point that style is going to catch up because even if he's in this great shape, is he going to come out here with some different style or something? Look, when he finally decides to let it go, he's super explosive. He's fast. He's so powerful, but he doesn't let it go that often. So now that he's had these surgeries, is he going to, is he going to let it go more? I, I don't know. Look, Black Beast is always live for a KO in any fight he's in. He's got that kind of power. They call him Black Beast for a reason. 79 inch reach, six foot three. The guy's an absolute beast, but uh, Blagoy is the better fighter here. Blagoy almost opened two to one. So unless Blagoy does something stupid, I mean he got floored against Tuivasa in that second round. So the openings are there, but the long term battle, if Blagoy doesn't get stopped, I, I think he probably comes out here and wins. So I'm gonna go Blagoy via close decision. Now next up in the welterweight division, we got Steven Wonderboy Thompson. He's 14 and 4, and Vicente Luque is 17 and 6. Currently, they got Steven Thompson, minus 120. The comeback on Vicente Luque is plus 100. Well, Shaq, after Vicente Luque went out there and beat Mike Perry, he called out Steven Wonderboy Thompson. He said, I want to fight Wonderboy. Well, now he's got Wonderboy in the Coco main event, Madison Square Garden, UFC 244. Does Steven Thompson uh, reclaim his spot as a top 10 UFC welterweight, or is Vicente Luque about to break into those rankings? No, I, I recall Steven Thompson after... Uh after he got knocked out against Anthony Pettis, which people want to say it's a fluke, but, uh, you know, if it was like a fourth round KO after he was down like three rounds, then I'd say it, but it was a second round. If Wonderboy <laughs> didn't get dropped every single fight, then it like, would be a fluke. He got dropped against Darren Till. He got dropped against 
Woodley. He Jake got Alford. dropped against Jake Ellenberger, so the guys got no. It was not a fluke. Wonder Boy has a suspect yeah. chin, and we've always known that. <laughs> like, wasn't a fluke at all. <laughs> like Anthony Pettis, is, you know, I, I haven't been the the nicest to that guy, but uh, and, I, and I'll continue not to be nice to him. <laughs> man, you got I mean knocked out Wonder Boy Thompson, so that was kind of alarming to me. Like, man, you couldn't even beat it. Like Eddie Alvarez says, Eddie Alvarez says at best, if you can't beat Anthony Pettis. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> then I don't know what to fucking say. <laughs> like, Eddie Alvarez has a saying that uh, if you're in the top ten and you have to figure can't out how to be Anthony, Anthony Pettis, Pettis, then you should you ain't in the top ten. <laughs> so there's a chance that Wonder Boy Thompson is you know free falling out of the out of the rankings. Now he's achieved great things, wins over Jorge, wins over Johnny Hendricks, this and that. I mean, the guy's definitely achieved a lot more in his career than Vicente Luque, who's only coming off a win against Mike Perry, who's a fringe top twenty five guy. A split decision win in fact. But uh Man, I like Vicente. I like his pressure. We already know what type of power he brings to the table. They don't call him uh, left hook Luque for no reason. And I mean, when he asks, uh, and it's gonna, and I'm very intrigued if Wonder Boy can eat that left hook. Now, I know that Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson is going to be running for dear life against him, and he's gonna basically try to try to weasel this fight out, as in weasel, I mean, run away from him and try to teep and, and, and land a couple cute kicks in, in two of the rounds and, and run and not do anything in the last one and see if he can, uh, and he thought that shit could work against Till and it didn't, um, so I feel like that's the type of game plan he's going to have, so Vicente is going to have to really put the pressure on this kid, don't stand on the outside and try to touch his chin, because I'll tell you what, if Vicente touches that chin a couple good times, like how he touched Mike Perry's chin or Barbarina's chin, now, I know those guys aren't on Wonder Boy's level, but Wonder Boy's chin ain't on their on those guys' level. So I think that uh, Wonder Boy is. I'm gonna be honest. I think he's washed up. I think he's been on on his way out for a little bit. I know he's still ranked, you know, beat Masvidal, and I could be wrong. He might come out here, and, and this might be that spot where this is a significant drop down in competition for him. But is it though? Because like I said, Anthony Pettis. I think that. Like, the fact that you got stiffened by Anthony Pettis, it's just like... A fat Anthony like, Pettis. Like, that's like... That's like, whoa. <laughs> like, like, Anthony Pettis stiffened you up like that in 2018, 19? With like, hands. With, ha- with hands, not even a kick. Like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, is that not alarming or what, man? So, I'm going Vicente Luque here by Vicious KO. I think he comes out here, maybe struggles a little bit to, to close the distance just because, like I said, I, I expect Wonder Boy, after getting knocked out like that, to not be too engaging and when you look at his fight with till he really wasn't doing much man i know a lot of people think he won that fight but you can't go into another guy's hometown and uh not do anything man so i feel like he's on the decline i feel like he's on his way out i feel like he's had a great run but i feel like it's time for these young guys like vicente luque who have earned their spot with uh was the eight fight win streak uh that he's on Nine six of six fight win streak six fight win streak uh Ten of his last eleven. And I know, like I said, I understand those names on that list are none of those guys are on Wonder Boy Thompson's level. But I think you're going to start seeing a Wonder Boy Thompson slowly drift down, and I don't think he's the same guy that he once was. I mean, the last time he had a good start, uh, clean performance from start to finish was against Masvidal, and Masvidal said that he pretty much got burnt out before that fight, and Masvidal was saying he was eating milkshakes, you know, he was getting in the fights with Bisping in the lobby. <laughs> and shit like that. So I think Vicente Luque is going to come out here and pull the upset, close the distance, and, and knock Wonder Boy Thompson out. Hey, Shaq, quick trivia. Who's won more recently inside the octagon, GSP or Wonder Boy? GSP. GSP. So, look, the bottom line is people can sit here and talk about how, oh, he beat Masvidal. And I know Masvidal's headlining this weekend. And Masvidal's a solid fighter at any point, but Masvidal showed up with love handles. Masvidal, was, Masvidal was bragging about <laughs> drinking milkshakes and <laughs> eating cheeseburgers on fight week. You know what I'm he saying? So, and, and since <laughs> after that fight, Masvidal took two years two years off to rededicate himself. So, I, I think this Masvidal easily beats Wonderboy. And for people saying that Vicente Luque hasn't beat anybody... Ask uh, Tiago Maheda Santos if he knows who Vicente Luque is. Next time you say that he's never beat anybody, that's all I gotta say. You know, uh, I guess Bilal's not on his own. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for those that don't know, uh, Vicente knocked uh, Tiago Maheda Santos out with a left hook. But anyways, look, Vicente Nico Luque, Price. Yeah, Nico Price, Bilal <laughs> Muhammad, all these guys, like he beat some legit dudes. But uh, I, I understand Wonder Boy was once ranked number two in the world. But as you guys know. 
one thing that Shaq likes to say is these things don't get better, these things get worse. And Wonder Boy was the perennial number one contender for the longest time. Then uh, then he moves to the number two spot, and then, you know, number four, number five. And now uh, we're dealing with Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson at number nine. So it's not like this guy went from 15, nine to one. This guy, well, he did originally, but now we're going from one to five to nine. And next fight, he'll be out the ranking. So. There's definitely a decline for Wonderboy Thompson. And for everyone saying that, oh, you guys are only saying he's chinny because of a fluke punch by Anthony Pettis, that's that's complete bullshit. Don't, don't ever disrespect me like that because this guy got dropped by Jake Ellenberger. This guy got dropped five times by Tyron Woodley. This guy got dropped by Darren Till. And then he got knocked the fuck out by Anthony Pettis. So to sit here and look at me with a straight face and say that Wonder Boy isn't chinny is complete horseshit. And with Vicente Luque, I know that he's very hittable. I know that in some of these stand and bang fights, there's been some sketchy situations. But the thing with Wonder Boy is I've noticed progressively, look, well, he's been chinny for a long ass time. But this is a guy that relies on speed and reflexes and all these things he fights with his hands down and when you fight with your hands down you know that as you get older this guy's about to turn 37 his next birthday he's pushing 40 years old speed is the first thing to go isn't that it wasn't that the case with anderson silva not comparing the two but the reason i'm bringing him up is because they both fight with their hands down well now it's starting to catch up to steven wonderboy thompson because you watch that fight against uh jorge masvidal who by the way was you know (laughs) eating cheeseburgers on fight week and Wonder Boy looked pretty fast in that fight. But then a couple months go by, he fights Darren Till. He looks a slight bit behind. He looks a little bit slower. He looks significantly slower than he did against Masvidal. Then you see his subsequent fight against Pettis, and you're like, oh my God, Steven. And one thing that these guys, Pettis, Till, and Masvidal, have all showed is that the leg kicks are a huge opening in Wonder Boy Thompson. You know who's got some great leg kicks, and specifically to the calf? Vicente Luque. And another thing he brings to the table is a very stabbing front kick. But what I like most Obviously, we know that left hook is amazing. His hands are on point. But what I like most about Vicente Luque is his forward pressure and his ability his ability to cut off the cage because that's exactly what you need when you're fighting a guy like uh, Wonder Boy Thompson. I think he comes out here, cuts off that ring, and knocks this guy out in the first round. So I'm going Vicente Luque to get the biggest win of his career, hit the top 10, and uh, get some bigger fights uh, down the road. Co-main event in the evening in the middleweight division. We got the former number one contender, Kelvin Gastelum, he's 16 and 4. And the former welterweight number one contender, Darren Till, he's moving up to middleweight for the first time. He's 17 and 2. Currently, they got Kelvin Gastelum minus 250. The comeback on Darren Till is plus 210. Well, this originally opened minus 155 for Kelvin. Now it's moved up almost a dollar for Kelvin. I know that Darren Till hasn't been in New York all fight week, he only arrived today. But, man, I have a feeling that him moving up to 185 may be very beneficial for him. Do you feel the same way? Man, I'll tell you what. I think that this is a very risky fight for Gaslam. Like, if he knocks Till out, all we're going to say is Till was done, Till was a fraud. So he's really he's really not going to get much that much credit as if he would have beat, like, a Cannoneer, or, which, which he would never do, <laughs> or, like, someone else at 185 pounds. Like... There's a good chance when they get in there, Kelvin's going to feel really weird, like, why did I fucking take this fight? (laughs) Um, And I know that, too, you know, people are putting a lot of emphasis on this travel thing, this and that, and yeah. But, man, I feel like, till I I mean, at this point, like, he's got to be really loose because it's like no one's really expecting you to win. And when when you count guys, now I'm not saying sitting here trying to act like Till's some world class fighter, but... A year ago, he 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 was thought to be of you know uh, like the next the next Conor McGregor. You know, a year ago we all thought he was. Uh, and, and and I've seen in the past when you when everyone writes a guy off like that, it it's kind of spells a recipe for disaster. I mean, everyone is writing him off. It's kind of like when everyone wrote Yair off uh, after he fought Frankie Edgar. You know, <laughs> he's done. He's it's over. You know, and that's where Till's at right now. So I, mean, I feel I feel like. Um, closer to the fight, it's going to be a lot less pressure on Till and, and a lot of pressure on Kelvin because it's like, man, I can't lose to this welterweight. Like, you know, uh, and, and another thing I like from Till is he moved up at the, I guess you can say he moved up at the right time because if he would have stayed for another fight at 170 and, and tried to make that cut and then loses three in a row or doesn't have a great performance, then it's like, then it, the 
the hype is probably over. But now, look, after that fight with Masvidal, I mean, look, he only lost to Woodley and Masvidal. Kelvin lost to Woodley as well. Um, so, like, let's not let's not write this kid fully off, man. He's still young. Now he's not, uh, you know, killing himself to make weight. I remember for the fight with Woodley, when they were asking him about that weight, it just seemed like the weight thing, because he had missed weight by five pounds of the fight prior. So, But it just seemed like that weight thing was overshadowing the fight. It just seemed like he really wasn't focused. There's so much pressure. And then you go into the fight, you know, you take a fight with George, and George was coming off a of national open against Wonder Boy, you know, like you said, the two years off or the 18 months or whatever it was that he took off. George come back at, at Street Jesus. And, and, and George Masvidal, we have to not forget that. George is one of these guys that we've always, even Dana said it. We've we've everyone seen the potential in George Masvidal for years. We've he's shown glimpses of that throughout his whole career. It just seems like the guy can never build any type of consistency. One minute he would knock out uh, Cowboy Cerrone, and then the next minute it's like he all the, the sh it's like my, uh, Michael Johnson thing, as where like the better guys he'd fight, he would do better against those guys. But when he'd fight someone a little shittier, then it seemed like he'd struggle, you know. So that's the type of guy Masvidal was, and it seemed like after the 18 months off that or I guess you could classify that as fighting down to your competition. But uh, it just seems like after the 18 months off, that Masvidal came back mentally different and Till had to eat the, re the repercussions of that. And Till, look how he was acting that week. He was getting into shit with Askren when Askren was doing the, uh, the fan... Uh, questionnaire thing and when you're cutting that weight you're not focused and then after that till definitely didn't show good signs he was still in taxis and <laughs> trash in hotel rooms it was time, on coke binges. Yeah, it's time to move up buddy <laughs> and uh i mean he took the necessary amount of time off i feel like till still got the the skill set man to, to do damage and if and if he moves up to 185 and and you know he's still a young kid i feel like man i'm gonna actually go with till and upside i love kelvin gasson i'm a big fan and, I, and I'm not even going to put too much emphasis on his last fight with uh, with Adesanya because Adesanya would, would do that to Till as well. But Adesanya, when you come off a, a title fight like that where it's like, where it's so like two to two going into the fifth and you just whooped his ass in the fourth round and then the fifth round goes that way. I know I've just seen in the past guys don't come back the same off that uh, title fight and he took a lot of damage. If he, It would be one thing if he really didn't take that much damage in the fight and he, and he was mentally fine, but there is a chance that he's not the same after a fight like that. There's a chance that his chin's not the same after a fight like that. Now I know I'm Till just got knocked the fuck out, but Till's moving up a weight class and this ain't I'm Till's, Till's probably feeling amazing right now he's like bro i feel fucking phenomenal bro i don't have to fucking cut all this extra 15 pounds so i'm gonna take till in an upset i think he's gonna come out here and, and and shock a lot of people man i think that kelvin gaslam is gonna i don't want to say be a little overconfident but i think that uh just that we're gonna see some new skills activated from till I think we're going to see him not make as much mistakes in the boxing with the more water in his head. I think he's just going to be thinking better, and I think he moved up at the right time. That's the key. I see a lot of guys like Rockhold, Wyman, Vic, and all these guys that move up, and it's too late. Kevin Lee, it's too late. The damage has already been done. I still think that till it was only two losses. You know, if it was two losses, uh, a questionable win, another loss. Then he moved up, then I'd be like, okay, he's done. But he took some time off. I think he's moving up at the right time. So I'm, um, I'm, and a lot of guys. It's, it's one thing when a young guy moves up in weight. When you got these older guys moving up in weight, like Jacare Wyman, Rocco, it's, it's already done. But he's, he's young, man. I think he's doing the right thing, and I think he, he's gonna get the win. I'm not saying the weight's gonna save him, but now I think he's gonna be throwing like how he was when he was younger. Uh, he was fighting Cerrone and all these guys where you were like, damn, this kid's got some hands you know what i'm saying so i think that uh kelvin's the reach i think it's gonna be a big reach advantage for till and i think uh he's just gonna not let kelvin get started and i think he's gonna knock him out man i think you bring up some great points it's definitely another fight like we've been saying on this whole show another dog or pass type fight man uh these odds are definitely way too wide and it's all that recency bias but also man i mean when you talk about the recency bias, you and I were front row seeing Kelvin Gastelum's, uh, we saw Izzy mop the floor with Kelvin in that fifth round, and people can give me this bullshit about it being two to two, and this and that, I mean, on our cards, I mean, I, I scored that fight 49-46, but, you know, we can be nice and act like he won two rounds, but the bottom line is, when it when it was two and two going into that championship uh, round, and in that fifth and final round, one guy had to make a decision, one guy had to bite down who was the champion, 
It wasn't Kelvin Gastelum at all. I mean, that was a 10-8 round, possibly a 10-7. Honestly, should have been stopped. But, you know, since the stakes were so high, he is a Mexican warrior. They, they, let, him, they let him survive. But between you and me, he got finished multiple times in that fifth round. And Darren Till... Man, uh, those last two fights were rough, but people acting like Darren Till's never beat anybody, that's complete bullshit, and that's disrespect, because he finished Donald Cerrone in the first round, he also went out there against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, I know we just shat all over Wonderboy, but I, I give Till a lot of uh, credit for that win, because it's one thing to go out there and knock out Wonderboy, but to actually beat him in a five-round points battle, I, I gotta say I was impressed, and people saying that that was a bullshit decision, probably don't know how to score fights, uh, two judges had that 49-46 Till for a reason. They said Michael Johnson and Stevie was a bullshit decision. I, was, <laughs> I, I, I scored for Stevie. Stevie. I thought Stevie won. First and third. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, Stevie won. <laughs> Stevie straight won Stevie that fight. Straight up won. But uh, look, uh, Till straight won that fight. I mean, if you want to give Wonder Boy the fourth, okay. If you want to give Wonder Boy the first and fourth, I mean, that that's a stretch, but I can understand. But only first and fourth, nothing else. Look, Darren Till won that fight. We can say nothing happened for four rounds, and then uh, he, he knocked him down in the fifth, even though – Things were going on. They were just very subtle. A lot of sidekicks to the knee. He did uh, fuck up his leg as well. So Darren Till's a very skilled guy. The weight cuts were definitely a big factor. I don't want to make too many excuses for him, but they were a huge factor. Now here at middleweight, the interesting thing about this fight specifically is that Till does fight with his hands down from time to time, but man, he can bang that left straight down the middle, and Kelvin's going to have to close this distance. Now, if Kelvin gets on the inside, I think he can land some very devastating combos, but while he's closing the distance, that's what he's got to look out for, you know, almost like the, the McGregor versus Aldo type situation. If, he's, if Kelvin's running in there with big hooks, you know the straight punch lands before the hook, so he's got to look out for that, but I do think Kelvin is favored for a reason here, and I slightly lean his way, but I think this fight is going to play out much closer than the odds indicate i think it's a dogger pass situation i'm gonna go with kelvin to win a a very close split decision maybe even a majority decision it might even be a draw you know what i'm saying but uh yeah i'm gonna go with kelvin but at the betting window it's either till or pass at, at plus 210 odds main event of the evening in the welterweight division we got jorge gamebred masvidal he's 34 and 13 and nate diaz is 20 and 11 Currently, they got Jorge Masvidal, minus 155. The comeback on Nate Diaz is plus 135. With Shaq, uh, two of the most exciting fighters fighting in the welterweight division. In the main event, uh, I mean, what else is there to say? I mean, I don't got to give these guys any introduction. You guys know who they are. Two total badasses, two legends of the sport. We've met both of them. Super nice guys. I'm a big fan of both. Who you got? Yeah, I remember I met Masvidal, and he had 30 people with him. uh, He still shook our hands. And he still shook and gave us betting advice, too. He said, don't bet the under two in my fight. So, uh, And it went to decision. He was right. (laughs) But uh, I think that Masvidal, man, those last two fights, he definitely, like I said, earlier than that, I kind of gave up on Masvidal just because, like, the Wonder Boy fight really pissed me off. Um, just, like, he got absolutely molly by Steven, and he just seemed like he really wasn't even trying, you know. Right away, you could tell, wow, this ain't even gonna... And, and, he, and, and you know, find out later, when before the Till fight, he said that that was the first time in my career where I felt burnt out. I just felt like, after the Maya fight, he was a little depressed. He, You know, that was his, uh, his title opportunity right there. He said he just uh, was burnt out, and after that fight, hey, when you take you know losses like that, it's good to take some time off. Now <laughs> he took eighteen months or the two years off, like uh, like how he did, and when you do that, and that can give you the time to do some really soul searching. Because Masvidal was just one of those big wastes of talent to me, man. I man, a couple years, like four or five years ago, I was telling people Masvidal is gonna win the belt, and this guy, how can you not love this guy? This guy's the shit. Like, but then he would lose these fights to Lorenzo. Larkin and and Benson and and they'd all be split decisions fights where he'd fucking miss it by like a little tiny hair and you know at 55 so you'd have the kind of tend the tendency to you know get up around really big and then completely stop fighting so I guess th- that was attributed to the weight cut I mean he, he used to do that like the I mean I know y'all remember the Masvidal coast <laughs> like you're like George you can't you can't just stop fighting like uh and he would do that all the time and so 170 when he first came up to 170 I mean, he went on that initial streak. He knocked out Cerrone in his hometown, and then uh, he ran into the the Damian Maya in the in the Wonder Boy fight, man. So, you know. 
then he comes back and he gets a five second KO and he knocks Till out unconscious in his hometown. And man, I'm t I, I feel like he's throwing with a different type of ferocity, man. I feel like he was always that kind of. I know he had some KOs, but now I feel like when he's throwing these combos, man, he's got very in the Till fight just because that was a longer fight than Ashkin. That uh, man, he's throwing with vicious, vicious intense. Now I know he got dropped by Till early. Till's a gorilla, but the combos Masvidal was throwing in the pocket after that were fast and sharp, man. So. I think that uh, he's definitely got a massive speed advantage over a guy like Diaz. Diaz is a very tough guy, very hard nosed. He uh, he knows where his skills lie. You know, he, he's not the best athlete. He's uh, kind of got two right feet in a sense. But Diaz is a tough guy, and Diaz a lot of his success comes from like Anthony Pettis, for example. If you, I mean, I picked Diaz in that fight. You know, if you hear what Anthony Pettis was saying before that fight, he was already done. I mean, <laughs> Diaz is that was a very good win for Diaz. I do think he's gonna show up a little better. I. I I didn't think he looked the best. I thought he looked really slow, and I think he's going to look slow here again. I mean, I think that uh, at 170, he's carrying a lot more extra weight. You know, his diet's probably not as uh, strict as it is to get to 155s. Um, I know Masvidal is also another former 155er as well, but I think that Masvidal, I feel like this is actually a really good fight for him personally. I know I see a, pretty much everyone's on Diaz this week, and I I, I don't, I mean, Diaz dog money, I, I, don't, I get it 100%. I mean, when you see his name with dog money, I, I definitely see why people will feel inclined to bet it. But Masvidal opened up minus 190, almost a 2-1 to one favorite. And I feel like slightly too many people are on Diaz. I feel like Masvidal's speed advantage in this fight is just too much for Diaz to overcome. I, I, I'm seeing the whole Diaz by decision thing. George gets robbed more times than a 7-11, but I actually think that this fight's not going to make it to the cards. I actually think Masvidal's going to knock him out for the first time, for to be the first guy to knock him out in a long time. We've seen Diaz get dropped by smaller guys like Conor McGregor, and you know, Conor McGregor was maybe on a different level at the time of when they fought. But that fight against Pettis, kind of, I don't want to say, I'm not going to discredit the win. I think it was a good win. He definitely fucked him up, but he was just the, you know, the, the, the tenth guy to fuck him up, you know. So I think that Masvidal is going to come out here and actually make a statement. I think he's going to stand in the pocket with Diaz. And, and, and then eventually, damn, the line just actually got worse. Um, and then eventually, you know, find a home for a, a vicious combo upstairs and, and put him out, man. I think the guy's fighting with a different mind state, a different type of ferocity. Whatever he did in those 18 months off where he didn't have his phone with him, I think it was the right thing. It definitely wouldn't shock me if Diaz won, but I just think Masvidal's kind of better. I, I don't know. I think he's, I think Diaz can't really sub him. Like, I think Masvidal, if he wanted to, could take him down and use his wrestling too. And let's not forget, Masvidal's a strong kicker, a right, a right-handed kicker, and Diaz really hasn't done the best. Uh, he's been fighting these guys like Conor McGregor who don't really use those traditional uh, traditional style of weapons. Pettis, you know, who doesn't really, he likes to use a little bit more fast years where Masvidal is kind of more of a, a textbook, you know, righty where he's going to throw power kicks on him and power hands. So I think that uh, Diaz is actually going to be in trouble here and I think Masvidal knocks him out. It could happen, especially if Diaz comes out a little bit on the slower side like he did his last fight, but we got to mention that his last fight was off a three-year layoff, and we've seen with a lot of guys, they come off that layoff. For example, Joseph Benavidez, very sluggish against uh, Sergio Pettis, and you might think he's done. Then the next fight goes out there and starches Alex Perez in the first round. So I'm not comparing Masvidal to Alex Perez, not even close, but all I'm saying is that I'm expecting a sharper version of Nate Diaz than we saw in that last fight, simply due to the fact that he's not coming off a three-year layoff this time and that's a huge factor to me now i agree with you when you say that jorge masvidal is the faster guy the better athlete i mean if these guys get on the track together now not the long distance track but if these guys go there and sprint i think masvidal is going to win that sprint i think he's going to win the vertical i think he's going to probably do more pull-ups than diaz but they run a marathon i got diaz too and uh what's interesting about this fight and i'm actually glad you brought up that masvidal coast because i was going to bring that up myself uh if Masvidal doesn't knock out Diaz, I'm kind. I'd be kind of worried if I had money on Masvidal. The reason why is because I could totally see Masvidal getting off to a huge lead, especially early on, blasting him with body kicks, going up top over the head with some big shots, specifically that overhand right, because as you know, that's a very open punch against a southpaw. So I definitely see the first round and a half, the first two rounds, going uh, Masvidal's way. But the thing is. 
it would behoove uh, Masvidal to go out there and finish Diaz because Masvidal, when he gets off to this big lead and he doesn't put guys away, he tends to admire his work and he tends to coast. And you start to coast against a guy like Nate Diaz, he will pick up that volume on you, no doubt about it. And you know how good this guy's cardio is. He can go all five rounds. So Masvidal better knock this guy out is what I'm saying here. And there's definitely a chance it happens. He's been both guys been knocked out before. Interesting, both guys got knocked out by you know guys that they would easily easily beat if they fought again. You're telling me Rodrigo Dam and Josh Thompson would beat these two guys if they ever fought them again? No, they wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, they, these guys Masvidal and Diaz would mop the floor with Rodrigo Dam and uh, Josh Thompson if they ever fought again. But uh, they're not fighting again. It's about this fight right here. Very tough one for me to call, and I honestly don't like picking against either of these guys. You know, but uh, sometimes you got to right. Uh, but I like these guys on a personal level. Met them both. Both such extremely nice and kind guys for the reputation they have. They were super cool when I met both of them. So I got all the respect in the world. Now as far as the skills are concerned, you got to give the speed edge to Masvidal, the athleticism to Masvidal. I'd give the cardio edge to, to Nate Diaz. Not that Masvidal is not a well-conditioned athlete because he absolutely is. But for whatever reason, when he gets off to that big lead, he likes to slow down a little bit. Not in terms of gassing out he's not out here huffing and puffing nothing like that the guy is a very well conditioned athlete but he loves to sit back and uh feel like dude i got this fight won i fucked you up so bad i dropped you in the first round i cut you up i did all these things now i can just chill and uh get my second paycheck and it doesn't always work like that and with nate diaz obviously you got to give him credit for his boxing he uh, definitely can pick up the volume on you, but what I'm most impressed with is his jiu-jitsu, especially in that last fight, taking Pettis back the way he did so easily, floating on the mat like it was nothing. I know Pettis gets a lot of shit for his takedown defense, and he absolutely should, but one thing is that not a lot of guys are out here passing Pettis' guard. Pettis is known for being off his back, throwing up triangles, throwing up all these things. He can't get back up, but guys are also not really passing his guard. Diaz passed his guard with ease, man. <laughs> Diaz uh, mopped the floor with Pettis on that mat. Now, I'm not saying he's going to do that with Masvidal, but what I am saying is I really hope these two hit the mat at some point because the jujitsu of, of Diaz mixed with uh, the scrambling ability of Masvidal would really create a, a fight of the night type situation if this hits the mat. Then obviously on the feet, you know these guys are going to be thrown with vicious intent, concussive blows on both sides. So, man, I really think we're going to have an all-out war. I know that sometimes when you get so hyped for a fight, it ends up not not delivering but the way these two match up I, I have a feeling this will deliver and uh i see masvidal going out there winning those first two rounds and maybe even getting a 10-8 somewhere along there maybe even getting a stoppage but if diaz is still in there this is going to get really really interesting come those third fourth and fifth rounds and i definitely think masvidal is going to get off to this big lead maybe even get a 10-8 round maybe even stop him along the way maybe even a cut stoppage but thing is Masvidal likes to admire that work he likes to coast and this has been a thing that's gone on historically throughout his career feels like he's beat your ass so bad let's go ahead and get that second paycheck and get on out of here and I guess a guy like Diaz that might come back to bite him in the ass and I actually think it will come back to bite him in the ass I'm saying Diaz comes out here and wins a majority decision after getting badly beaten in the first two rounds comes back wins those next three and Masvidal is going to cry robbery because he's going to be robbed more than a 7-eleven and Diaz will be crowned uh, the baddest motherfucker. And now we got to hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute. And joining us now on the Big Marley Minute is Big Marley himself. Kyle Marley, it's going down this Saturday. Jorge Masvidal versus Nate Diaz for the baddest motherfucker title. UFC 244, how's it going? Not bad, yeah. I cannot wait for this card. This BMF belt uh, could be fight of the year. Super pumped for that fight mainly, but the whole card's pretty decent. We got 30K up top on DraftKings, so I'm excited to chase it. And I heard a rumor that for UFC 244, Kyle Marley does have a max bet available at bestfightpicks.com. Is that right? Yes, sir. We got a max bet. We're going to win this 10U, trying to pay off uh, a whole yearly subscription in this one night. If you guys are trying to sign up for that, that's only 800 bucks. Monthly's at 200, so it's a hell of a deal going with that yearly. Might as well do that. Um, and then we're going to cash in this weekend. But yeah, got that max bet. I already sent you the DraftKings breakdown, so we're ready to make the money. And let's get right down to business, because in this main event between Masvidal and Diaz, man, such an unbelievable fight between two legends of the sport. Are you kind of leaning towards uh, the athleticism of Masvidal, or do you think the volume and cardio of Nate Diaz can take over late? So this is 
it's definitely an all in fight. This, this has to be in every one of your lineups. Um, you stack it in cash. I think you can even stack this in GPPs because it, we could see 200 points come from this fight just with the volume that these two throw. Um, and with a BMF belt on the line, you, you, you got to think they're going to be trying that much harder, giving it to the crowd. So I'm just all in on this fight. Um, so I'm going to lean with Masvidal here. I think Diaz is going to be the higher owned guy. Just seventy four hundred dollars for Diaz. It's just too cheap in a five round fight. So I think he's going to be super popular. So I'm just going to uh, go the other way this weekend. I'm going to go heavier on Masvidal, and I'm going to get probably like. 60 70 percent plus on Masvidal and then Diaz would be in the rest of my lineups that's kind of what I'm seeing in my head um but the, the issue with that is if Diaz wins he's he's 100 percent a lock for the nuts lineup if, there's no way he wins and doesn't end up on that 30k lineup so it's going to be a big risk going more on Masvidal but I think it's going to give me a lot of leverage and I do see him getting the win here I think he's the better boxer of the two and he, he's going to be hard to break. And that's what Diaz is good at. He's good at breaking people with his boxing and his pressure and his volume. And then when they break, he steps on the pedal. And that's when we see the Diaz come out and he starts just laying it out on these guys. So I, I think it's going to be hard for him to do that against Masvidal, especially with Masvidal being the better boxer, um, which which is going to be different for Nate. Usually he's, he's the better boxer in the match. So I like Masvidal in this one. Um, I think he could even get it done by TKO, but... Diaz is so hard to finish, so you can't really count on that. So that's why I think it's just going to be an all-in fight, and you could even stack it in GPPs. Like I said, I will definitely have at least one or two GPP lineups, even in that, you know, going for the 30K, because I could see that being on there. If, if this is a whole five-round fight and Diaz loses a five-round decision, he could still put up 80 points in a loss. So put all your lineups. Every one of them's got to have this fight in it, and uh, I'm going to pick Masvidal to get the win. So in the co-main event, you got Darren Till moving up to 185 pounds. He's taking on the former number one contender, Kelvin Gastelum. Uh, which uh, former welterweight do you think gets back on track? Um, I'm actually I'm going to pick Till in this one, but I'm not confident in that at all. Um, it's just more on a card where I want to pay up for some guys. I got I to gotta pay down, and I think Till is one who could get a knockout in that 7,000 flat. That's going to put him on the nuts if he does, and I think Gastelum's going to be real popular, so it would kill off a good amount of lineups. But, man, if he doesn't get that knockout, he, he probably wouldn't even score highly in a win, even at 6K. I mean, I don't know if you know a 66-point win would put him on the nuts. So Gastelum's probably the better play on paper because when he wins, he scores highly. He usually scores more than 100 DK points when he wins, and then we just saw Till get knocked out. Kelvin's definitely going to be testing his chin here. So I think he's the guy with the more upside. Um, it's, it's just on a card where I'm, I'm searching for some dogs to, to kind of make myself different than everybody else. Till's going to be in play for me at 7K. And I think people are overlooking him a little bit here. I think the line on Gastelum's getting a little wild. I think people are reading into the, the late travel a little bit too much. I think it will affect him, but I don't know. I just don't, I just don't think it should be this big of a difference of salary. So I'm going to end up having more till here. I actually think we can kind of get away from this fight too with it being the co-main event. It's going to gain a lot, a lot of ownership just combined. So fading the fight kind of makes you different as well, and I don't hate that approach. If this is a three-round decision and Kelvin wins with you know 75 points, he's not going to be on the nuts, and that's going to be a lot of lineups that are killed. So in the Coco main event, you got Stephen Wonderboy Thompson taking on Vicente Luque. Welterweight feature bout, and Vicente Luque has been calling for a top 10 opponent for a very long time. Well, now he's got it, Kyle Marley. You think he passes the test? Uh, I I am going to pick him here, and I think he is going to be one of my favorite dogs on the card. Um, it's not a confident pick at all, but when he wins, man, he scores high. Like, he's got 109, 145, 121, 107, 111, 105, 106, 115, so those are scores that I really like on DraftKings. And at 7,700, a score like that is for sure going to be on that $30,000 lineup. So he's going to end up being one of the underdogs I target more this weekend. But this is a tough matchup, and Thompson fights in general just don't score high. He's a hard guy to score highly against. And he could get a knockout of his own, so he's definitely in play. But I'm going to lean towards the dog in this one, and I'm going to hope that Luke gets it done. So this fight, this heavyweight matchup between – 
Blagoy Ivanov and Derek the Black Beast Lewis is interesting from a DraftKings perspective because obviously both guys got knockout power, but man, both guys have very low activity. So where, where do you kind of stand on this one, man? Yeah, you're, you're going to need the knockout in order to score highly with this fight. And I don't feel confident choosing either one of them to get the knockout. So most of my lineups are not going to have this fight in it just because I don't want to take the chance of of it being a three round striking match where, you know, the winner hits 45 points because that's going to kill you who, no matter who wins. So I might have, you know, one or two of these guys in my lineups just in case they hit that knockout. But I think Lewis is the more dangerous guy. So he's the one I'm going to prefer here. And he's $200 cheaper on DraftKings. So I like that as well. Uh, but yeah, I think this is one you could totally just, just not even worry about in the hope that it's not a first or second round knockout. And as long as that doesn't happen, I think we can just, just coast it to a, a, a decision win, just fade it and let the winner get 50 points. I think that'll probably be, you know, 35 to 45% of the field lineups are dead. Um, so no issue, not even putting this fight into lineups, but you know that these are big boys and it only takes one punch. So you also have to be a little bit nervous, completely fading it, but I'm going to go with Lewis. So kicking off the pay-per-view, you got a lightweight matchup between Gregor Gillespie and Kevin Lee, and we all know Gregor Gillespie has been a DraftKings dream up until this point, but I got to ask you now, Kyle, you think he can put up those same amount of points against such a massive step up in competition? I mean, this ain't Jordan Rinaldi and Yancey Medeiros anymore, my friend. Yeah, it's definitely his toughest fight to date, and maybe he's not going to get 100K, I mean, 100 points on, on DraftKings this week uh, because of the tougher match. Maybe he can't get as many takedowns, maybe he's not going to get the knockout. Um, so if there's ever a time to fade Gillespie, maybe this is the week because he's going to be one of the highest owned guys. I just think, I mean, he's too good and I, I love the ceiling that he's shown us. So I can't do that. He's going to end up being one of my favorite guys on the slate and he's not even the most expensive. So you got to like that as well. Um, Luke's scores were impressive, but Gregor has had 152, which is ridiculous, 133, 133, 128, 107, and 100 in his wins. So I, I just can't fade that, and I think he's playable in all formats. I, I do think he's going to take down. So I, I like uh, Gregor to get it done and probably score high again. I don't think he's got that 152 in, his, in the ballpark this time, but I, I do think he can get 100-plus in this matchup and finish Kevin Lee. So I'm all about it here, um, but I will say that any lineup I have without Gregor, uh, Kevin Lee is going to be likely in that lineup because, like we said, this is definitely his toughest matchup yet. Maybe Lee can get takedowns of his own or finish of his own, and at 7,100, I mean, we'll probably never see that price tag on him again, so I'm a little bit interested in that as well. It's just I'm on Gregor here. Well, Kyle, that's why you're the DraftKings guy for half the battle. It's going down this Saturday. They can follow you at Big Marley 3. Your bets and your write-ups are available at bestfightpicks.com. Yes, sir. Let's let's get this max play. I feel real good about it. Um, so go buy that. And then if you're only buying the weekly, just save that extra profit. Buy the yearly. We'll just keep crushing it for the rest of the year. Um, so let's get it. Good luck to everybody. Hopefully somebody listening can get that 30K if it's not me. Good luck, everybody. Well, before we talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch, you know we promised the fans that we were going to answer these fan questions. I know we're long overdue, so we want to thank you guys for bearing with us, but let's fucking get down to it. Thank you guys for all your support. So Ian Gifford wants to know, is Shabazian the real deal? All right, we're going to – he asked a lot of questions, so let's answer each one in order. So is Shabazian the real deal? We're going to find out this weekend, man. He looks very, very legit to me, but uh, there's only one way to find out. Throw him in there with a top 10 guy. That's what's going down, so we're going to find out. Um, is Shabazian the real deal? Um, I guess for his age, yeah, win or lose, yeah, just because at 22 years age, 22 years old, already with a win over Darren Stewart, and he's been smoking every other guy that he's fought in less than a minute and some change. So I would say that he's the real deal. We're definitely gonna find out this weekend. But win or lose, I mean, to be 22 years old and uh, to already have a win over Stewart and with some of the skill sets that the kid has, uh, I would say yeah. Will Lee make weight? I have no idea, man. I know he struggles I'm a, I'm a, guess, a lot. I'm a guess, yes. Shaq saying yes. And can he stop the takedowns? Uh, initially, it just depends if okay. it gets to that fatigue uh, state. Right. Um, so will Lee make weight? I'm going to say yes, just because, like, I think 
I think he's going to make weight. That's that's my guess. Uh, can he stop the takedowns early? Yes, because I think he's much faster, uh, much uh, better athlete, uh, more experienced uh, in the high-level fights. And how does their wrestling match up? Now, Lee's uh, a D2 wrestler. Gregor's a D1 national champion, but we know that MMA is a little bit different. Um, Gregor, we haven't, but it's kind of like Askren. You know, Askren's a national champion wrestler, but like I told you last week, but who have you seen it really? What other f- good grappler have you really seen it up against, you know? That's kind of the same position Gregor's in because, I mean, I know he's a national champion, but like, I can name like 10 other guys that can take down Jordan Rinaldi and, and Vince Pichel and you know, uh, fucking Jason Gonzalez and, and all these guys, you know, so we're about to see if the jury is still out, but we're about to see how really good his wrestling is this weekend. Yeah. I mean, look, if they, uh, put on the leotards, uh, <laughs> but yeah, if it was a match for points, um, I'm sure Gregor would win. Um, right here with punches yeah. and kicks, knees yeah, and exactly. elbows is a different story. So we're gonna have to find out, man, is Pitbull still top tier? Fast striker for heavyweight. I mean, dude, he's three and nine in his last twelve. But yeah, he's got some speed. In term, yeah, in terms of speed, yes. Just because he's a little bit lighter in speed. In terms of speed, yes. If Walker wins, does that warrant a title fight? I think it warrants either if he knocks him out with a vicious flying knee or something that we've never seen before. Yes. But if it's a little bit of a tougher fight and he gets a knockout, then maybe he has to fight Reyes for the number one contender fight, and then maybe you know. Because you can't deny Reyes is undefeated. So. I love Johnny Walker, but I'm going to say one more after yeah, this because I don't consider Corey Anderson to be the kind of guy that you beat for a title shot. And that's no disrespect, but that's just my opinion. Will Mr. Chance encounter? It's Rem Counter. <laughs> Mr. Chance encounter strike again. Uh, we're about to find out. Uh, mm, who kid, knows? The kid has that type of vibe. I mean, I like him. I, I like him. His striking is uh, ugly. <laughs> um, it's definitely not good, but man, he, he's from the Osage Nation, man. They, you know how those natives are. They're tough. They don't quit, and and Lyman's quit before. So Lyman once stole his corner, man. I don't want to get knocked out. So that that's all I need to say. Who is the baddest motherfucker? Uh, Shaq says Masvidal. I say Diaz. Oh no, nah, that's not my baddest motherfucker. My, uh, oh he oh he doesn't mean in this main event. He nah. just means in general. Oh sure. Well, if he means in this main event, yeah, I'll say Masvidal. But in general, I'm gonna say uh, man. Oh, in general, uh. Francis and Francis and Gano, John uh, Jones, John Jones, Gaethje, Poye, you know, Max Holloway, all Max those guys, Holloway, Izzy, Izzy, and uh, Venutolo wants to know who's most likely to pull a stunt as a favorite. That's a great question. Um, there's definitely some possibilities here. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is definitely. I would uh, say, um, well, okay, a stunt. So a stunt would classify as in he should fucking handle the guy but he does something stupid okay so i'm gonna say calvin maybe or shane burgos Burgos maybe or um yeah um, hakeem dewald has been known to pull his thumb (laughs) my boy uh 420 mma wants to know what are you guys dressing up for dressing up as for halloween to be honest with you man as a kid my parents did not believe in that holiday, so uh, I really wasn't. Uh, I can probably count the amount of times on one hand that I, I could with two fingers. Yeah. Uh, my parents really didn't allow me to get uh, all up, and they were like, "Bro, <laughs> you're about to put on a costume and, and walk around and asking people for candy." Like, come on. <laughs> but no, nah, uh, no, nah, I'm I'm not dressing up for Halloween. Uh, but you know, I don't knock anyone that does, man. I, I've been known to rock the Spider Man, but it's been a couple of years, man. I was joking with my jujitsu professor; someone should walk in uh, can wearing a black a, belt. Can you imagine a grown man wearing a Spider Man? <laughs> <laughs> like, if I had to pick a costume, I'd go as the Joker, though. Oh, so so he's got options here. Just don't show up to your jujitsu class wearing a black belt. Is all I gotta say. Rampage fan four twenty wants to know what happens if Wonder Boy loses, especially by KO. Um, if he loses by KO. Then he's going to be on the bottom tier of the top 15. Um, will he retire? I doubt it, just because he can still make some money fighting you know, prospects. I guess if he loses, he'll be become the new guy that uh, the prospects fight. Like, uh, who's, the, who's the prospect tester at welterweight, right? Like a Neil Magny, you know? Yeah, I mean, he's already <laughs> about to be out the top 10. Um, he's at number 9 as we speak. He was once number 2. So, you know, there's your answer, man. He's going to be that gatekeeper. 
Kings MMA says, who is your most confident pick and least confident pick on this card, despite the odds? Go to bestfightpicks.com. Use that promo code Matador to find out. But shout out to my boy, Kings MMA. He's shown us a lot of support. So much, yeah. much love to you, brother. The Filthy Frankster says, let's say Gastelum wins in impressive fashion. Do we just book the rematch effective immediately? He's talking about the Izzy fight. All right, let's answer that first. Uh, no. No, because if he if he knocks him out, then we got to do the Cannoneer fight for number one contender. Yeah, and there's Costa out there as oh, well. Oh, yeah, but Costa's out for eight months, so we know he ain't going to be fighting anytime soon. But if he if Kelvin wins him versus Cannoneer. Also, say Connor fights Cerrone in January and that he wins. Easy to say he's your next uh, BMF challenger against the winner of Jorge and Nate. The thing with that filthy, filthy Frankster is the guy. Is, I know that we all love McGregor from three, four years ago, and and this and that. But guys, let me let me say this again. Imagine being an O and O boxer, never had a professional boxing fight in your life, like. I might have had some amateur, but that's amateur. Imagine putting an amateur to fight Floyd Mayweather. I'm talking the fucking greatest boxer of this fucking generation. 50 and 0. Beat fucking Pacquiao, Canelo, fucking Zab Judah. <laughs> uh, fucking Marcos Maidana. Maidana. Fucking Shane Mosley. Like, bo- like real legit boxers that got serious bodies on their resume. Imagine being 0 and 0 putting on the gloves with them, and then, you know, taking the... And that boxing damage is different than MMA. That's just straight head trauma. So, like, what I'm getting at is Conor McGregor is not going to be the same guy anymore, man. I mean, he's already not as confident as he, as he once was. If you hear the guy talk now, now, he you know, he doesn't have that same conviction, conviction that he once has. And I feel like if people are expecting to come back into MMA with all this time off, you guys already know how this shit is. You got you you step out the sport for this long, these guys are passing you up, bro. Like, 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 kind of like uh, fucking uh, like Kane Velasquez trying to come back, you know, <laughs> of all this time off. Like, son, you really think you' about to just come in here? whoop de doo and just get back into the title picture at heavyweight? Like, even, and, and that's a shallow division, and he got, you know, and Francis was only coming off, uh, you know, one win, and two, lost two of his last three. But what I'm getting at is I don't expect McGregor to ever be the same after that Floyd Mayweather fight. Like I said, a 50-0 boxer versus an 0-0 boxer with that type of head trauma. And then he comes back, not to mention, and what about the ground and pound from the heavens from Khabib Nurmagomedov? And he got dropped in that fight. He fucking got smashed. It wasn't even, you know, the, the Khabib and Dustin fight. I know Khabib dominated him for the most part, but at least, like, there were some moments where it was, like, you know, a good fight, as where this one was just, like, a molly whopping of a century. So, uh, I, Cerrone's a good opponent to come back to for him. I say that's a good move, just because Cerrone, you know, he's been fighting too frequently, and I feel like it's finally starting to catch up to him. So I'll say maybe he can get if 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 it's one he's gonna get at 155. It's this one, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. But is he the next to challenge for the BMF belt? Um, the BMF belt should should fade away after this, but unless they really want to start defending this, I mean. I personally think this is the one and yeah, so. only fight for BMF, but I will say this. Uh, we've seen him fight Nate twice, but if he ever fought Jorge Masvidal, Masvidal would mop the floor with McGregor. Quote me on that. And thank you for the question, brother, and all your support. Jack Sizzle wants to know, what the fuck is wrong with Anderson's finger? Corey Anderson? No idea, but what I want to know is what's wrong with his chin. <laughs> his, I don't give a shit about his finger. <laughs> <laughs> we got some funny ass questions. Not gonna answer that. All right, Tom wants to know: Is Kevin Lee going to look for a way out if Gillespie dominates the grappling in the first? I think the only way he looks for a way out is if he's completely gassed and he's been yeah, broken in the fight. I don't think Gillespie's gonna just come out here and do what he does in the first round. I just think Kevin's too. Even though he's washed up, I just think he's like maybe Kevin's a guy that gets hurt. You know, uh, gets hurt with punches, man. You know. He's not a guy that necessarily comes out and then just gets taken down. Um, and you got to understand, Kevin's been fighting much higher level competition. So I think Gregor's going to have to actually, you know, get some good stand up time uh, to win this fight. So I, I think he can out make him quit in the late rounds, though. Yeah. So let's uh, see these YouTube questions. Warrior Like wants to know who's next for Whitaker. He thinks he deserves a rematch um, with Adesanya. Oh, I, I, I don't think he does, unfortunately, um, just because he pulled out of the Kevin Gaslam fight. And when you do things like that, you, you kind of lose your stain. Um, 
and he pulled out the day of. I know it was a legitimate a legitimate reason why he pulled out, but I don't think he deserves anything right now. I think that uh, if he wants to come take a fight back and get into the title picture, it's either Jared Cannonier. And I know I know everyone's scared of Cannonier right now, um, but it's either gonna it's got to be something like that or you know uh, who else is up there. I'm gonna go with Whitaker versus Hermanson. Both are coming off second round knockout losses. Uh, one guy needs to get back on track, so that's what. You want Jack to lose again? <laughs> <laughs> Mario says, y'all need to trademark the words pulling stunts. I appreciate that, my man. He says, what do you think of Leon versus Tyron? I think Tyron Woodley's days of... Uh, I think Tyron Woodley had a great run. I respect him. He was a, he was a good a good champion, um, even though he had some of the most boring title fights of all time. But Leon, man, Leon looked good his last fight. Um, Leon's... Man, Leon's no slouch. You know? I think... Uh, well, I mean, let me ask you this. Uh, Mario, is this Mario Mario or nah, different Mario? Okay. Probably different Mario. Um, Mario, did you see, Woodley? I know it was uh, Usman, but did you not know within thirty seconds that Tyron Woodley was going to lose that fight? <laughs> I mean, that that and I think Hollywood might have got to him a little bit, buddy. But um, we'll see, man. I hope that I hope that's the fight. I mean, that's the fight to. I mean, you got Kobe and Usman fighting. Uh, you got Diaz and uh, Masvidal. I mean, that's the that's the next fight. Tyron's been thinking he can. <laughs> Tyron's been thinking he could get fights with Diaz and shit like that. Like, bro, you got to be exciting to get a fight with Diaz. Yeah, <laughs> Diaz doesn't even know who he is. But uh, as far as Leon and Tyron, I mean, yeah, Tyron can knock anyone out. He's got a puncher's chance, but the volume and the just work rate of Leon should be too much if he stays conscious. Michael Knight wants to know, apparently Rob Whitaker has a fight book. Is UFC really dumb enough to do an immediate rematch? I personally don't think, don't he's, think, getting, I don't think he's getting... I don't think he's I've been hearing Romero's getting that fight, but I have no idea, I so... Don't think he that we'll see. Alonzo says, how bad is Till's boxing defense? I mean, it's bad in the sense that he fights with his hands down and his chin up, but he's got good distance management, so we'll, we'll see what happens here with Kelvin, but uh, I don't think it's the worst I've ever seen. I think that a lot of guys have more tall man's defense than Till does, and I think he knows what he's doing. He just... He's kind of young, likes to fight with his hands down and his chin up. Uh, when you're older, like Wonder Boy, who's almost 37, that's when uh, it starts to catch up to you. And granted, Till did lose his last two fights, but they were against very world class guys. Kelvin's also a world class guy. You gotta, I definitely got to bring that up. So I, I don't think it's that bad, but it's obviously not Just the best on either. Who he's fighting. Yeah, John Owen says, which MMA gym do you guys think has oh, the best supplements? Um, okay, Jackson yeah. Wayne. Um, Back in the day, Jackson Wink, but now you got Kings MMA, you got uh, um, TriStar, Kings MMA for sure. Uh, ATT can't forget that. Oh, you mean Anabolic Top Team? <laughs> 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 um, uh, you know, I'm just saying when guys go to Fortis, all of a sudden their careers get changed. I'm not saying anything, but <laughs> <laughs> Julian wants to know. Um, First of all, he says, cannot wait for your release. I appreciate that a lot, man. He says, do you think the BMF title is just for show, um, or will it turn into a new stable with its own weight class? Nah, nah, nah. It's just for show, and how do we actually feel about the title? I mean, it, it's just cool to see guys like Masvidal and Diaz get their uh, their due. You know, I'm not really, you know, to actually sit here and act like they're the world, they're the welterweight world champion, that would be a little disrespectful to guys like Usman, but it's cool to see guys like yeah. Diaz and Masvidal get their shine and headline a pay-per-view. My boy Julian, that's a very good question. How I feel about the title is initially I thought it was a complete joke, but I get the reason why they're making this title is you got two different ends of the spectrum, and I'll bring you know about four or five guys into it. When you think about Colby, Covington, Kamaru, Usman, Leon Edwards, Tyron Woodley, those are what you would consider guys that you know. Kobe and Usman, especially, and Leon, you know, those guys like to utilize a lot of wrestling. Their fights are a lot more, you know, one-sided, as in they dominate most of the time. I mean, both of those guys, I can count how many rounds they've lost on one hand, you know, as where Nate Diaz and Masvidal are more, you know, uh, I don't even want to say exciting because I think Kobe and Kamaru are exciting just in different ways. Like I feel like Colby and Usman don't get enough credit if that's what if that's what you're kind of uh, getting towards. I think that Dana White has a better relationship with Masvidal and Diaz in comparison to Usman. He's always going at it with Usman and he's always going at it with Covington. And and to be honest, I'm gonna go ahead and say it here: Do not be shocked if Diaz and 
uh, Masvidal is a more one-sided, boring fight or even a lackluster. And I guarantee you, even though Colby and Usman are both wrestlers, I guarantee you that fight would be more exciting. And I guarantee you that fight has more chances of somebody getting knocked out. Stragley says, where does this card rank on your top five cards of all time? Honestly, bro, I have to see the card before I judge it because there's cards that look like shit and then they end up being amazing. There's cards that look amazing and end up sucking. And then there's cards that look amazing and end up delivering. So we're going to have to see, uh, but I'll be happy to answer that Saturday night or Sunday. Dream Team MMA says Amsterdam will be watching. Awesome. Can't wait to go back to Amsterdam. Shout out to, uh, shout out to my girl, uh, Jermaine Durandamy. Let's, let's go. Yeah. Um, you know, go over there to the coffee shops. Hit up some edibles. Hopefully, uh, they ain't too strong because we're gonna be tripping. We don't know where we live. We don't know where we don't know anywhere around there. But I'll go to uh, Amsterdam to visit my girl Jermaine, my boy Cr. But if y'all know all the spots, uh, let us know for sure. All right. So and then we got to answer some from last week. Uh, My boy K did said, "Would you rather fight a hundred thousand frog-sized Davison Figueredos or a hundred Davison Figueredo-sized frogs?" Man, I don't. Neither. <laughs> I still get as fucking serious. I don't want no God of War smoke, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what should UFC do to keep Francis busy? Uh, my boy Stilio Cantos asked that. I think, to be honest, Francis is gonna is kind of in a bad position because he knocked out Curtis Blades twice already. You know. Curtis Blades is the next highest guy uh, rated after him. And everyone else is coming out. You got Volkov, who's fighting Greg Hardy. And everyone else, it's like if you put him in there with Francis, it'd be a formality. So it's like, and if you put Rumble in there off this big layoff, he's going to get knocked out quick too. So it's like, unfortunately, Francis is in a bad spot. He just has to pretty much sit out or... They need more. They need more heavyweights. But I'll tell you what: if Rosen, if Rosen Strike comes out here and knocks Arlovski out in like a minute or less, don't be shocked if they put him in there. I heard uh, Dana White's got to fight for Francis. Um, they're actually they just legalized MMA in France, and they want Francis to headline that event. So I'm very curious to see who the opponent is. But I hear they definitely got something in the works. All right. So Matthew Drucker wants to know who would we match up Leo Santos with? That's that's a great question, man. He's a very underrated guy. Doesn't get the respect he deserves, and he's the kind of guy that can come off a three year layoff, come back and look better than ever, and knocked out Kevin Lee, knocked out Stevie Ray, undefeated in the UFC. So let's pull up let's pull up these rankings real quick and see who we match up uh, Leo Santos with. Because honestly, I, I think he's a top fifteen guy. He's been a top fifteen guy. It's just he's not active enough to be ranked in there, but. I mean, you can match him up with an Alex Hernandez. You can match him up. I mean, Anthony Pettis, that'd be fun. Uh, He's not going to get the... But, uh, Hernandez is realistic, but Pettis ain't. Um, I say, uh, hold on. I like the Casey fight, the Hernandez fight. Um, a fight with Darius, maybe. Um, oh, I like that, that Darius fight. That's, that's yeah, good right there. A fight, yeah. Darius, Hernandez, or... What's the other name I said? Um, Darius Hernandez. Maybe a hot sauce. Maybe a uh, you know a, a top twenty, a top twenty-five guy. For sure. Caller wants to know what happens if Gregor can't take him down at will. It will become very interesting. Then we gonna see if the boy can box, Mister uh, Bitcoin Caller, because uh, I'm a little I'm a little skeptical if he can box. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great question, man. Um, I honestly hope you can't take him down at will so that we get that question answered. All right, and here here's the last uh here's the last bit. How much does Shaq uh bench? Uh in my days, man, in, in my days, bro, in my, my senior year of high school, man, I could I, I think I got 315 one time. Damn. So. <laughs> yeah. More than me. My boy Ricky Jitsu wants to know who does Cannoneer get next. Great question, man. Uh, I know Kelvin's going to turn that fight down, but uh, it's going to be a uh, top three guy. It's going to be one fight yeah. away from a title shot. So yeah, number one contender fight. Whoever's available, he's going to get a big fight no matter what. Willie D said, after everyone got burned by Lord McCall, what sticks in your mind as the biggest stunts ever that was pulled? Him him and Crute this year, um, the, the biggest stunts, Joe Jua, Earlier this year, uh, I didn't bet it, but man, that was one of the most epic stunts I've seen in a while. Cause she was on top of her, and then she like flopped to her back from mount. It was crazy. I was like, <laughs> um, 
McCall pulled a massive stunt. Granted, it was against OSB. Jimmy Crute pulled a massive stunt against Serkinov. Almost had him finished and then uh, quit. Um, Look, when we talk about biggest stunts ever pulled, you can't have that list without mentioning Anka Live versus Paul Craig. Oh, man, yeah. That's a that's an epic stunt right there. I mean, that was... <laughs> That was a, a massive... What about uh, Antonina versus Roxanne? No, just because... She, she was a huge favorite. No one should... You know, why did y'all have so much confidence in her takedown defense? True. All right, let's see. <laughs> can Bisbing get a cyborg eye by 2030? Bro, Bisbing can do whatever the fuck he wants. That's a... He's already in the Hall of Famer. I was going to say future Hall of Famer. He's already a current Hall of Famer. Um, worst fight you've ever seen live? I don't know. Um, the worst fight I've ever seen live is, man, I hate to say it, but Boyan Vukovic <laughs> versus Michael Graves. I mean, that was like... Uh, that definitely killed the mood in the <laughs> arena. Like, Yo, turn this shit the fuck up. That was a uh, UFC 201, Boyan Vukovic versus Mike Graves. Another one that comes to mind is... I'll tell you which one for me. At UFC 136, I saw a fight between Maya and uh, Jorge Santiago, I think is his name. And, dude, when I tell you the whole place was booing, like <laughs> people were getting up and leaving their seats for that fight. For the last two rounds of Yoder and Kondo was just... Oh, that was bad, too. Just because I wanted it to be over so bad. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for all your questions. Truly appreciate it. Going to try to make this a regular thing. So thank you guys to all our fans for all your support. Now, Shaq, we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC 244? My fight to watch is going to be Gregor Gillespie versus Kevin Lee. Because, look, Kevin Lee, if he loses his fight, man, it's most likely going to be over. Not in the sense that he's going to get cut, but it's just going to be – it's going to be over. It's already over, but it's uh, – <laughs> <laughs> but it's just going to be really over. And and then he'll be one fight away from getting cut. And Gregor Gillespie, if he – if he wins this fight, then the, it'll be exactly what the UFC wants. You know, they want to put this guy in the rankings. They want to promote him, so they'll get their way if he wins. But if he loses, man, you know, Gregor's going to have a long way back to the top because it's not like he's one of these younger uh, prospects. He's, you know, he's had a long athletic career, so a lot's riding on that fight, in my opinion. Definitely. For me, the fight to watch is Johnny Walker versus Corey Anderson. Uh, just all the talk surrounding this fight from the fighters, but then also from the fans, uh, people acting like... The guy, the, the people acting like the chinniest guy at 205 pounds has a clear path to finish. Uh, one of the most explosive knockout artists that we've seen in a while in that division. For that reason, I'm so intrigued, man. I cannot wait to see uh, if this whole thing about Corey getting past the first round to come out here and out volume Johnny Walker and do all these things, or if Johnny Walker is just, just going to come out here and flatline him like I think he is. So, for that reason, Johnny Walker versus Corey Anderson is my fight to watch. Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC 244? My fighter to watch is going to be, you know, I was going to say Johnny Walker, but you kind of just hit on that. But So I'm going I'm to say Jorge Masvidal. Look, a couple of years ago, this guy, I thought he was a goner. And now he's turned things around to a point where he, he's one of the biggest stars in MMA, kind of overnight, man. And if he can come out here and get another vicious another vicious win on his record, this guy's stardom is going to blow up to a point. I mean, guys, every time you turn on ESPN, Who's fucking on there? George Masvidal is like, yo, this guy's a bigger star than Diaz now. <laughs> like, fucking. So I, I feel like George Masvidal, if he wins this fight, is the, every so likable that uh, he might end up being the biggest star in MMA. So uh, Masvidal's my fighter to watch. Yeah, I mean, anyone uh, in that main event is going to be the fighter to watch. It's Masvidal versus Diaz. Make sure you tune in. But for me, my fighter to watch is uh, Vicente Luque. Look, you're talking about a guy who's quietly put together a 10-2 and 2 UFC record. He's going out there knocking out most of his opponents. The ones he didn't knock out, he darts choked. Uh, the ones he didn't darts choke, he won by decision. So Vicente is capable of winning fights by any method. And uh, he's one of these emerging uh, welterweight prospects. And not only that, he's more experienced in MMA than his opponent, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Now, he's not more experienced at the highest level, but he's got a lot more fights under his belt. And this guy has paid his dues in every sense of the word. And not to mention, he's just a very exciting fighter to watch. So for that reason, Vicente Luque is my fighter to watch. Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down. 
This Saturday in New York for Madison Square Garden, UFC 244, Masvidal versus Diaz. They can follow you at MMA Genius 05. They can follow me at Best Fight Picks. Our Instagrams, Best Fight Picks Official. Shaq's is Shaq BFP. Thank you guys so much for all your support. You can get our bets at bestfightpicks.com. Use that promo code MATADOR to save 15%. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all the spots we are available. Special shout out to our sponsor, Flav C. CBD. Go to FlavCBD.com. Use that promo code BATTLE to save 10%. Want to thank all our fans so much. Uh, really, really love you guys, and uh, we're going to be back next week. So until the next time, let's cash these bets.